Okay, Madam Chair, we are ready. I call to order the April 6, 2021 meeting of the Seward and Planning Zoning Commission. Commissioner Charbonneau, will you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Oh, can I call? Just a second. Oh, call. Yes. Please. Uh, we are calling in... We're calling in the other um, commissioners, so be just a second. Welcome to the GCI Conference Center. Please enter your access code. Follow. Thank you. Please stand by. If you are the chairperson, please enter. You will now be placed into conference. There are three participants in the conference. Good evening. Will you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Commissioner Schreiber, will you lead us? Participant of the conference is the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Wall call, please. Um, can we ask the people on the phone to please mute? Tonight's roll call. Swan? Yeah, I figured that out. There we go. Got it. Commissioner Swan, did you hear your name called for a roll? Commissioner Swan? Here. Cease? Here. Ambrosiani? Charbonneau? Here. Verhe? Here. Sullivan? Here. Chair Eklund? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. <clears throat> Commissioner Ambrosiani, are you online? There were three and he was going to be... We're one of them. Sorry, our line is represented. Oh, our line. Yeah. Okay, so he's yeah. not on. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, that takes us to item four on our agenda, citizens' comments on any subject except those items scheduled for public hearings. So um, those who are signed in will have the first opportunity to speak. Time is limited to three minutes per speaker and 36 minutes total for this agenda item. Is there anyone signed in under public uh, under citizens' comments? Yes, Madam Chair, we have three. The first one is Carol Griswold. This is Carol. Carol, you are with the Planning and Zoning Commission, and you have three minutes for citizen comments. Thank you very much. Um, a point of clarification for the attorney. As a potential change in the official maps, doesn't a petition to rename a street require going through the 1501-035 amendment process and securing signatures of 51% of the area property owners and posting a notice? That process helps to raise awareness and show support among the most affected neighbors. When my daughter was in third grade, she won a little contest to design a cow for the museum. The happy plywood cow wears a canvas raincoat in the museum display, an ingenious innovation that anyone in Seward can appreciate. We still have a Seward Dairy Bowl cap magnet from the museum gift shop. The longtime dairy located at Dairy Hill is a fascinating part of Seward's history. Dairy Hill is a recognizable geographic feature rising above the lagoon. The name Dairy Hill Lane has been in use since the 1950s. Council renamed former Government Road to Chamberlain Road in 1990, and few now remember who he was. It makes sense to clean up the confusion by renaming Chamberlain Road to Dairy Hill Lane. Dairy Hill Lane is an utterly charming and historic name. Please recommend that Council keep it. Thank you for 
your consideration. Thank you. Next person signed in. Okay, the next one is uh, comments from Cheryl Cease. I'm writing to you regarding Resolution 2021-010. I am strongly opposed to renaming Dairy Hill Lane to Chamberlain Road. This represents a threat against Seward's history. Dairy Hill holds an important place in our early history, and it would be a great loss to see you make this change. Surely some other street could be named Chamberlain, maybe one of the new streets in the new subdivision above Doorway. Please do not sacrifice our history for... Do we have a motion? I'll make a motion. Okay. Motion by Charbonneau. Do we have a second? No. I'll second. Second by Sullivan. Discussion? Is there any additions, deletions? Seeing or hearing none, um, take a roll call vote on the agenda, please. Voting on tonight's agenda and consent agenda. Swan? Yes. Verhey? Yes. Sullivan? Yes. Charbonneau? Yes. Ambrosiani? Yes. Cease? Yes. And Chair Eklund? Yes. Your agenda and consent agenda are approved. And I'm not sure that you have any. I don't see conference. anything under consent there agenda tonight. There are no consent tonight. items. Nothing. All right, that takes us to item six, special reports and presentations. A, city administration report. I'm going to keep it short and sweet since Thank we you. have a nice long meeting tonight. I just want to introduce our new planner, Courtney Brinkhurst. She is on her second day on the job, so everybody be nice. <laughs> and Courtney will tell everybody a little bit about herself. Thank you. Yeah, so just briefly, I grew up in Pennsylvania and got my master's degree in landscape architecture and environmental planning from Utah State University. Then I worked under the regional landscape architect for the National Forest Region 4 on their forest plan revisions. And then also worked for the state offices for the BLM in Utah on, on their strategic planning for a national trail and have since moved up here and I'm excited to work for the city. Welcome. Thank you. And then one other thing, um, just in case everyone doesn't know, um, Andy has left the city. His last day was the 24th. He will be missed. And we currently have a planning tech position open, and it is listed online with our web page. Thank you. Any questions for the city administration this time? Seeing none, item B, other reports, announcements, or presentations. Are there anything tonight? All right, that takes us to seven special items. Um, it is our time for election of chair and vice chair. I will turn to that page in the packet so we follow along. Um, I'm going to open nominations for the position of chair. I'll nominate Cindy Eckland. I'll second. I'll third it. Is there no. any other nominations for chair? I will close nominations. And um, is there uh, unanimous consent? Yes. Aye. Yes. All right. <laughs> Thank you. At this time, I'll open nominations for vice chair. I'll second. Okay. A nomination for Tom Swan. Um, motion by Charbonneau, second by Ambrosiani. Any other nominations? Any objection to unanimous consent? Congratulations, Commissioner Fun. Swan. You are the Vice Chair. Bravo. <laughs> Congratulations to you for being Chair. Thank you, Tom. All right, that takes us to public hearings. Um, under public hearings, we limit our comments to five minutes. Those who have signed in will be given the first opportunity to speak. And we don't have any unfinished items under public hearing. And under new business items requiring a public hearing, um, 
We have number one, resolution 2021-008 of the Planning and Zoning Commission of the City of Seward, Alaska, granting a conditional use permit to Seaview Community Services to operate recovery housing, substance abuse treatment center, and medication assisted treatment, MAT, clinic within a four unit multifamily dwelling on lot 21A, block 25, original town site of Seward located at 402 Second Avenue within the auto commercial AC zoning district. Um, staff report, please. Madam Chair, can I take this off so you don't hear me mumble? Sorry, before uh, we proceed, can I have a motion in a second? Oh, please? yes. Uh, before that's administration report? Okay. It needs to go on the floor for discussion. Okay. I'll uh, motion. Motion by Ambrosiani. I'll second. Thank you. Second by Charbonneau. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Staff report, please. Seaview Community Services applied for a conditional use permit from the Sewer Planning and Zoning Commission to operate a recovering house, recovery house, substance abuse <coughs> treatment center, a MAC clinic within the four unit multi dwelling at 402 Second Avenue. This property is currently zoned auto commercial. And it was constructed in 1950 as an auto repair shop and on June 4th, 2019, the Planning and Zoning Commission um, issued a conditional use permit to Carol and Robert O'Neill to operate a four-unit multifamily dwelling. The applicant Seaview Community Services Recovering House Program provides short-term housing assistance and treatment to indi for individuals with substance use disorders and co-occurring conditions. Seaview will implement the recovery housing expansion first, followed by an additional addition of residential treatment and then a medication assisted treatment or MAT clinic. The surrounding land use and zoning is auto commercial. It is intended to provide areas to accommodate highway oriented commercial activities such as offices, certain institutional uses, limited personal services and retail uses requiring substantial outdoor activity, traffic and parking, and which also serves the offices and nearby residential areas, and which does not materially, materially detract from the neighboring or nearby residential areas. The surrounding properties include a mix of residential zoning. The neighborhood property to the north is single family, zoned R1, to the west, across the Second Avenue, is a second single-family home zoned urban residential. To the east, is an uh, and across the alley, is a single-family home zoned office residential, or OR. To the south, across Jefferson Street, is a single-family home zoned R1. Development requirements for the four-unit multifamily dwelling meet, same, meet some code, zoning code development requirements. Table 1510220, including lot coverage, minimum buildable lot size, and building height. The structure on the property is located within a 10 foot yard front yard setback and a 10 foot side back or setback adjacent to Jefferson. The building was constructed in 1950 and therefore is a non conforming structure. There is nothing related for the flood plain status. The utilities, the water, sewer, and power are available to the property. Adequate fire, police, and solid waste disposable services are also available to the property. Parking is based on 1510215B. Two parking spaces are required per dwelling plus a half space for every unit larger than two bedrooms or greater than 1,000 square feet in size. Based on the application materials, the structure consists of two units less than 1,000 with two bedrooms each. One unit is less than 1,000 square foot with three bedrooms, and one unit is greater than 1,000 square feet with two bedrooms. The number of required off-street parking spaces for this development is eight, and eight parking spaces are shown on the provided plan, site plan. The Community Development Department um, notified property owners within 300 feet of Block 221A, Block 25. They were notified of this proposed conditional use permit action. Public notices were posted on the property, and all public hearing requirements have been met. 
At the time of the publication, we had received one inquiry, which was included into the packet. We have since received 14 emails that will be read into the record this evening. Um, our staff received eight phone calls, and questions that were asked were answered. Um, for staff review, we sent out our electric department had no comment. The fire department and building department requested that prior to occupancy, the following shall be met per the International Fire Code, or IFC, and the International Building Code, IBC. To install monitor, to install required monitor residential sprinkler system that meets IFC and NFPA 13R, require fire system that meets NFPA 72 and IFC, to install a NOx box, any locking devices including electric locks will, meet, will need to meet egress requirements per the IFC fire and life safety inspection once all the requirements are met. Prior to the MAT clinic opening, all building and fire codes concerning a mixed use occupancy shall be met and a stamp architect letter stating the code compliance has been met. The applicant will work with the city and staff prior to remodel, construction, and other changes of use. The Harbor Police Department Public Works had no comment. And the recommended conditions are as follows. The applicant will work with city staff through the building <coughs> permit process to address and accomplish any of the required upgrades and modifications. Prior to the following, they should be completed the IFC and IBC to install the IFC or residential sprinkler system that meets IFC and the NFPA 13R required alarm system that meets the NFPA 72 and the IFC to install a NOx box. Any locking devices, including electric, locks will be met with egress requirements and IFC fire and life safety inspections once they are all met. A code study of the building and fire code concerning a mixed use in regards to life safety and accessibility shall be met and a stamped State of Alaska architect letter stating that the code has met compliance. Protective bollards installed to protect the fuel tanks in the parking area. The applicant will work with staff prior to any remodel, construction, and any other changes of the use. The applicant will work with all city utility departments for any possible upgrades to water, sewer, and or electric utilities prior to the certificate of occupancy being issued. <coughs> all parking and maneuverability shall remain on site for the life of the use. Eight off-street parking spaces are required. Fair proof and third resistant containers shall be provided for all garbage and refuse for the life of the use. Per Seward City Code 1510-325F, an approved CUP shall lapse six months from the date of approval if the use for which the permit was issued has not been implemented or a building permit has not been attained. The Commission may grant a six-month extension upon finding that circumstances have not changed significantly since the date of the initial permit approval. Modification of the final approval of the conditional use permit may, upon application by the permittee, be modified by Planning and Zoning Commission. A. When changes condi changed conditions cause the conditional use to no longer conform to the standards for its approval. B. To implement a different development plan conforming to the standards for its approval. And the modification plan shall be subject to public hearing and a filing fee set by City Council resolution. Community Development Department recommends the approval of 2021-008, granting a conditional use to operate a recovering house substance abuse center and MAC clinic within a four-unit multifamily dwelling at 402 2nd Avenue, lot 21A, 25, block 25 of original town site modern motor subdivision in an auto commercial district to Seaview Community Services. Thank you. At this time, I will open the public comment section, and I would um, want to start with those who are here in person for the public comments, and then we'll move to the phone call, and then we'll read those comments sent in. Okay. 
The first person signed up is Grace Williams. Please come forward and state your name and address for the record. My name is Grace Williams, and I live at 203 Monroe, which is at the second corner of 2nd and Monroe. Um, I'm going to start by reading a letter from Seaview's Governing Board. I am the Treasurer Secretary of that board. Dear Commissioners, we, the members of the Seaview Governing Board, ask for your support of the conditional use permit that Seaview Community Service has requested to allow dedicated staff to meet a community recognized and requested need. As you know, the property is currently zoned for principally commercial uses with an auto commercial designation. This designation allows a wide variety of commercial uses with varying pluses and minuses. No zoning chain is required for the conditional use permit and it is quite possible the use could have less neighborhood impact than either the former automotive garage from the 1950s to the 1980s or the more recent use as a four unit multifamily dwelling also operating as and with most of its income from nightly lodging. As you may or may not know, Seaview Community Services has owned and operated two residential properties within City of Seward since the 1980s and late 1990s, respectively. Similarly to the modern motor building, Seaview's other residential properties were obtained and have been used to meet the needs of the community and assist Seaview clients. All of Seaview properties are professionally maintained, managed, and operated. We hope the city continues to value the contributions Seaview staff and volunteers have made to support our community and clients since inception nearly 50 years ago as a homegrown nonprofit. The Seward Council on Alcoholism. The council was incorporated by its first governing board, 10 concerned Seward residents, on June 22, 1972. We endeavor to carry on their good work and maintain the high standards set. And that's sincerely signed by Mary Huss, Lynn Hole, Patty Price, Grace Williams, David Kingsland, Jim Depkin, Jeff Dillon, Patrick Mesmer, and Trish Hart. And those are from the Governing Board of Seaview. And then these are my own comments. <coughs> I am here in favor of the commission passing resolution 2021-008 granting Seaview Community Service a conditional use permit for the building located at 402 Second Avenue. I think we can all agree that when we hear the words substance abuse, addicts, or drug use, the first thought that we have is not pleasant. This is because the stereotype the movies and the news has pushed is always the worst. The truth is that most of us probably know, if not love someone, who suffers from substance misuse. We probably also know those who suffer and we are unaware of their affliction. This stereotype does not fit all who suffer from substance misuse. Some of us are lucky enough to know someone who's recovered. I've heard people who want to know who is, will be at this facility. And I need to remind everyone that Seaview is a behavioral health organization and that we must comply with HIPAA regulations. Seaview will never disclose who their clients are. They don't disclose it to their governing board and they won't be disclosing it to the public. Claims of where these clients may come from are unfounded. No one except Seaview personnel know who, why, and how they came to be in this program. At the time the new building opens, those who are currently in our program will have moved through and not be residing at 402 Second Avenue. The program is designed for clients to be housed in a safe, clean, controlled, temporary environment while they seek service for substance rehabilitations. Our clients go through an extensive review process by clinicians. Seaview wants them to succeed so they try and make sure this type of program is what the clients need. I've been on Seaview's governing board for going on 10 years. Myself along with eight other volunteer residents who all have different backgrounds and ideas make up this board. We are made up of educators, law enforcement, ministers, parents, coaches, entrepreneurs, retirees, but mainly we're just people who generally care about Seward and its residents. 
Most of us were on the board when the initial program was brought before us, and we asked a lot of the same questions that we're going to hear here tonight and that I read online this last week. We spent many lunch and weekend meetings discussing the need that Seward had. If we had the... Is that... Am I done? I can't see the time. Yes. Oh. Yeah, just to finish one, the end of that sentence. Mm -hmm. Oh. I don't know where it is. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Are you able to move it out so you can see the timer or no? Oh, yeah. I didn't realize you could I'll see it. it. Thank you. Okay. okay, the second speaker. The next speaker, Madam Chair, is Jim Dupkin. Oh. I can see the timer. I'll put my timer away. Okay. Uh, hello, planning and zoning members in the larger Seward community. My name is Jim Depkin. I am pastor at Seward Moose Pass United Methodist Churches. I am on the Seward Providence Mountain Haven Community Board. I'm on a lot of other boards as well. I'm on the board of directors at CV Community Services. And perhaps most notably, I live on the corner of First and Jefferson. Therefore, I'm presently a neighbor of the proposed recovery housing expansion. I can see that property from my kitchen window, the dining room, and the front door. When my parents stayed there several summers to avoid the chaos that was and sometimes still is our household, my kids could wave to my folks from our window and we could watch them all the way to their door. I have four children who have used the bus stop on the corner there, a couple who have attended TYC camps, and we take family walks past the property almost every day. That's usually on our home stretch. First off, some of the dialogue that has appeared online, yes, I'm looking at you, Facebook, has played up the notion that our little corner of the town is some idyllic, quiet residential area and that providing this place of care would somehow upset our quiet neighborhood life. I live across from the hospital. We have helicopters often and the occasional parade of law enforcement when an injured person needs a little, we'll say, extra police attention. We've had a couple of manhunts in my time. Um, and there is, of course, the influx of runners and hikers heading up and down the mountain throughout the summer months. We have a variety of people walking around our area, headed to apartment complexes, going to and from bars, using the laundromat, assessing the various services downtown offers. No one else seems to have a problem with it either. We have many places within five blocks of my house where we can get alcohol and now legal drugs. Yet there's a big stigma for those who seek help for substance <coughs> misuse. The language we use dehumanizes and disparages the very people who are seeking help. We turn those seeking help into some type of monster. Perhaps that may be why some have suggested that many sewerdites are more comfortable going elsewhere. They can get away from the stigma of those who live next door or down the street. Just a reminder that the program CV seeks to provide in that space and is already presently providing elsewhere in the community is for those actively in recovery. It's a recovery program. And if you're not in recovery, you're not in the program. This is a program for those who are seeking help, and it would provide more space for individuals to get that help in the community, with a priority for local residents, some of whom are already your next-door neighbors and are not getting the care they want and need. This is not a place for people in crisis to come down off of their crisis. That can be done at the police station or hospital, which are both also in the downtown area. While, yes, there would be people from outside of our community, this could provide a continuum of care for the local shop owner, the long-term employee, the local teacher, the young adult who grew up down the street from you, who would benefit by receiving their care here, surrounded by the support systems they need, and also near those they are trying to support in the process too. Now, I've been on the Seaview board as long as I've been in Seward. I used to say that it was, I had to put on my big boy pants when I went there, because the work they do is really valuable, and for many, it truly is a matter of life and death. It's serious stuff. And with changing regulations and rules related to funding streams, all the while fighting the labels that get assigned to those seeking assistance for mental health and substance use disorder, I would occasionally say in meetings, we just want to help people. Why does this have to be so hard? By approving the conditional use permit, you would be making it a little less hard to help people in our town. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next signed in is Marie Gage. My name is Marie Gage. I live at 107 Low Canyon Road. 
and I do believe in rehabilitation, but I do not believe an alcohol and drug rehabilitation center should be in the oldest neighborhood in Seward. And I do not believe treatment can be forced. I contacted three different treatment centers in Alaska, the Serenity House in Kenai. They have 12 clients they have beds for. They're not full, and they're located 12, 10 miles out of town, down Cave Beach Road. They do accept volunteers and court ordered and releases from prison. They're not a lockdown. I contacted the Trustworthy Recovery in Wasilla. They can house 15 clients. They are not full. They accept volunteers, court order, and releases from prison and seven miles down Connick Road, not in a neighborhood. Then the Ernie Turner Center is in Chugiak, Alaska. It has 16 bed facility and it is not full. Only accept volunteers and it's a lockdown facility, not in a residential neighborhood. I have um, a advisory petition from the areas affected by CU facilities and there are 59 names on that. I only went to the people that are on 2nd or in that block and I also went down to 6th Avenue where there is a facility. And on 6th Avenue, it was very sad when I went. They said they feel like prisoners in their own home. The meetings were held outdoors. They exercise on the street. One lady said as she steps out of her house, they're looking at her. They had meetings with um, Seaview, and the fence was built to try to keep that down from when they had their meetings outdoor and keep the confidentiality. One person has called the police three different times. Um, they're not notified of walkaways. They read about it in the sewer journal. Just three weeks ago, it was in the police lock. One walkaway that made the news was a release from the maximum security prison at Spring Creek. He was a gang member, convicted of DUI, domestic violence, and assault too. It took five policemen to arrest him in Kenai. He were left here and went to Kenai, and he was wake wearing an ankle monitor, which he had cut off. Seaview screens their clients, but this one somehow slipped through the cracks. Another complaint was the exercise in the street where three were wearing ankle monitors. They were so... <sighs> so bad they had, they had a meeting with Seaview to see if they could help. And what Seaview suggested is that maybe they just put their fence up around their own place. Why not build a center on a property by Spring Creek or, how many, um, or over by the airport? The railroad has property there. This building is 1.3 million. You know, that's a lot of money. You could build something that was made for this. And you know, they can't answer it, but how many locals are currently in this treatment center? Do we consider Spring Creek Correctional Center prisoners, locals? They are counted on our census. And the question for CU is, how do clients pay? Do they have to have insurance or Medicare? Can just the Joe Blow go off the street and say, hey, look, I have a problem, I need help? No, you have to pay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next speaker. Next, Madam Chair, Eric Van Eck. Eck? ECH? Is that right? Or EC yeah, ECK. ECK. Thank yep. you, sir. Um, I'll give it to this guy. That was touching. But the truth Could is. Could you state your name and address for the record? Okay. I live, I, my name is Eric Van Eck. I live at 109 Old Canyon Road. I also can see that building from my front window where I raised seven kids and an adult. My adult child went through Seaview and it was terrible. Loss of counselors consistently, uh, change of staff consistently. I don't know how they manage this, but when he went through, we went through four or five different counselors in a very short period of time. It was so bad that he was like, well, I can't, I can't attach myself to a counselor, and then have them leave. What's the turnover rate for Seaview? Oh, we're going to keep this fully staffed. It's going to be professional. Yeah, right. I walk that block every day with my kids. The truth is, if you bring rehabilitation in there, you bring drugs in there. A person is not going to change until they're ready to change. I'm in law enforcement. I know this. I've seen multiple, multiple people try and get out of this, they're back in. It's, this is not the place 
to have some kind of treatment center. This is trying, we're trying to build a family-oriented thing here. Okay, yes, do the police officers take drug addicts to the hospital? Of course they do. Do helicopters land there? Yes, of course it's a hospital. So, for him to say, hey, we have all of these other things that happen there, sure. There's, uh, they, they come in there and they stay the night. How many of those guys are drug addicts? Who knows? But one thing I do know, everybody who goes to that place will be a drug addict now. And that's not what we want in our neighborhood. That's not what I want for my kids to be able to see. You're going to walk down the road with your six-year-old, and the six-year-old's going to say, hey, Daddy, what's that guy doing? Oh, he's exercising. Why is he in the street? Because they have no yard. There's no extra place for them to go. So we're going to have the same problem as the next guy. All these guys in the street doing burpees with ankle monitors on. That's what you want your kids to walk by when you take them on a family walk? Now, I carry, I carry a, a baton with me when I go on a walk for dogs, in case a dog comes up. Because sometimes we walk down alleys and not everybody keeps their dog on a leash. But that's for dogs. So what's next? This isn't fair to us. We don't want this in our neighborhood. They want to take this down the road and down into a more commercial area, that's fine. I think that Miss Gage had a great idea. It's $1.3 million, build it next to Spring Creek. They got plenty of space up there. They already have all of the everything in for it. I would prefer that this not get put in. I don't want to see this in my neighborhood. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Um, last signed in tonight is Zach Johnson. Hello, commissioners. My name is Zach Johnson. I live at 421st Avenue, right near the hospital. Um, I cannot see the building from my house. There's many cottonwoods, and the, the Ambrosiani's house is right behind ours. However, I do have two young kids. They play outdoors with his seven kids, two more kids up the Canyon Road, another kid down the 1st Avenue. My kids ride the school bus every day, to and from. The last thing that I want is for my kid to be at the bus stop and find something that's been hidden outside by a drug user. I've worked with drug addicts. I've worked with them in Montana. I've worked with adolescent males. The locations that I've always worked at are like the other places that Ms. Gage described. 40 miles out of town, in the middle of nowhere. One of them was a 4,000 acre working cattle ranch. It was dedicated to adolescent males, drug dependent adolescent males. And even then, you would still find things that would be dropped off outside the property that they could go and try to find and bring in. I worked with guys in Colorado that had their little special hidden hiding places that they wouldn't get caught by the staff having outside. It's scary to me as a parent. It worries me. Do I believe in recovery? Absolutely. I teach construction to prisoners at Spring Creek to help them to be able to get a job on the outside so that they have the skills needed to have a successful life. Many of my students are drug addicts, heavy users, in prison because of their problems. But I will tell you this, it's not always them that I'm going to worry about. It's the people that they were associated with before they went to prison. A lot of those guys, a lot of that type of population, have ties to clubs and gangs and such that when they get out, as anonymous as they might try to be, they are found, they are pressured to go back onto a substance because then they're under the control. And they're easily manipulated to do that. I've heard countless stories of guys that were in recovery, that were in a methadone drug-administered facility. They get plucked. They get taken. They're forced to get high. I don't want that where I live. Be, put it by Spring Creek. It's 
a phenomenal idea. Years ago, there was actually talk of trying to build something there for this purpose. It never went anywhere, but now might be the time. So I hope that the commission listens. I hope that we can think about, you know, the fact that there's going to be kids there, that there is TYC there. My kids are outside every single day. We've already had to answer the questions of what's this? It was a needle found at the bike park. I don't want it to be on the corner. I don't want it to be next to the bus stop. I don't want my kids approached by anybody that I find to be a risk and to find to be dangerous. I don't think it's right. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we make the phone call, I'll just ask, is there anyone else here in the room or in the hallway that wanted to make a public comment on this item on the agenda? Please raise your hand. If you want to go to the podium, state your name and address for the record. Hi, I'm Cameron Kowalski. Um, I'm a little bit nervous, so if I'm a little bit shaky, I'm sorry about that. Um, I'm a lifelong Seward resident. I've been directly affected by addiction my entire life. Um, some of you know my parents own the Pit Bar, um, a well-known place for addiction. I lost my mother to a drug overdose in 2004. Three days before that, there was an intervention, and she chose not to go because it wasn't here. She couldn't be with her family. She couldn't run her business. Uh, my brother is still a recovering addict to this day. He's in sobriety right now from heroin. And I think this opportunity is great for Seward. Um, a few of the comments. Um, can we move the bus stop if it's right on that corner? I mean, is that another solution? Another thing is Seward's pretty Mayberry. You're fortunate to have your kids as sheltered as they are here, but this is the reality of the world. Opiate addiction is real. Finding dirty needles is real. Bike park or outside of a rehab center. We're really lucky to have this Mayberry, but let's teach our kids right from wrong. Let's say that is an addict. He made a bad choice. Let's use them as an example, like I do with my brother, like I have my entire life with the addicts I've been around. So I think we got to look at the big picture. I think the location isn't a big concern, but what, how are we raising our kids? We need to teach them. Seward is not Anchorage. They're going to go out in the real world someday, and hopefully they'll know what ankle monitor means or be able to see recovery and a good thing. So that's my comment on it. I'm really grateful to see this going in. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in attendance in this room wishing to speak on this item before I move to the phone? Seeing no hands. Um, clerk, would you call the uh, public person that wanted to have um, the phone Madam call? Chair, I don't have any. You do. Um, Ms. Ms. Griswold, Griswold signed up for all public Oh, she items. sure did. Thank you. Yes, I appreciate that. I will call her. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Uh, Carol, you are with PNZ, and you have five minutes for public hearing testimony on the Seaview facility. Thank you. Thank you. 
footage. The four units require test spaces, not eight. Clinic and staff spaces are not included. The medical care cl clinic requires two spaces per treatment room, plus one for each doctor and other professional practitioner on site. That would be at least three for a total of 13 off-street parking spaces. More spaces should be required for the two to three on-site on -site staff. Insufficient off-street parking will push vehicles off-site and impact the neighborhood. This 20-bed facility is one of the largest in the Kenai Peninsula and even Alaska. Instead of being nestled in a private 40-acre woods, like the 12-bed Serenity House between Soldatna and Kenai, or on a two-plus-acre lot 15 miles out of town, like the 16-bed Homer Set Free Alaska Center, this facility is a fishbowl on four city lots in a neighborhood. We can look at them, and they can look at us. No one has any privacy. It's stressful for everyone. The findings listed that TNC must establish are incomplete and inaccurate. The center and clinic are not compatible and will drastically affect the nearby neighborhoods in downtown. The impacts on the value of adjoining property is difficult to show as there are no comparables. The upset neighbors do not agree that this is an excellent location for a recovery center. But with a price tag of $421,300 over the borough assessed value, my property values go up. It's quite a stretch to state that this proposal is consistent with community values, land use, and housing, or is in harmony with the comp plan or strategic plan. We value our safe neighborhood. The lot is zoned R1 in the future land use plan in harmony with the rest of the neighborhood. Four apartments, which offer year-round, seasonal, and nightly lodging, are being replaced by tax-free, short-term use for treatment, not housing. The proposed use is harmful to the neighborhood, public safety, health, and welfare. Kids live in this neighborhood. A school bus stop is located directly across the street. A pedestrian pathway is located directly adjacent to the building along Jefferson. The Boys and Girls Club is a block away on 3rd. We are concerned about a pipeline of court-ordered felons from the prison, walkaways, potential for increased crime, noise, disturbance, and calls for police, and increased pedestrian and vehicle traffic that will change the desirable character of our single-family neighborhood and community. New ownership and new conditions are an opportunity to clean up existing violations of non-conforming structure enlargement, right-of-way encroachment, setback requirements, and lawn coverage. Allowing these violations to continue sets a precedent for future such violations. Please see my comments and additional conditions starting on page 47. Considering all these issues, the Planning and Zoning Commission cannot find in favor of this resolution. Good idea, wrong building, wrong location. Even frogs know to jump before the water gets too warm. Please vote to deny the CUP. Thank you. Okay, at this time we have how many letters? 14? We have 14. And myself and Fire Chief Christ are going to start sort of tanning and reading to you. Okay. So we'll read, I'll read and then he'll read. Um, this email is from Lori Landstrom, Inside City Limits. Hello, P&Z Commissioners and City Staff. I fully support Resolution 2021-008, granting a conditional use permit to Seaview Community Services to operate a recovery housing, substance abuse treatment center, and MAP clinic within City Limits. I commend Seaview for being brave enough to tackle this thorny issue. I support to ending the stigma of addiction. Please grant this conditional use. Your community needs this so badly. Thank you, Lori Landstrom, local health care provider. It's from Ann Mead. Here's Jackie Wild. I've been in sewer for eight years. I had known many people who receive treatment and help from the Seaview Center. The services they provide community members are sometimes life-saving. People who would be homeless for mental disorders are given a chance to get treatment, housing, and support. 
I really can't express how important it is to acknowledge a health crisis in the beginning stages. The Seaview Center has acknowledged it and are taking steps to help prevent members of the community get their lives back after substance abuse issues. It is a huge impact on the future of a city to try to help. I really support this new residence that Seaview Center wants to acquire. It will be a good location for healing community members in need. However, I am aware that on social media platforms there is opposition. I'm not sure if it's a disinformation campaign, but I hope that council tries to weigh the credible information about this issue. Thanks for your time. Sincerely, Ann Wheat. This is from C.J. Horner, City Limits. Hello, my name is C.J. Horner, and I am one of the owners of 336 2nd Avenue. Our property is located directly across Jefferson from the proposed Seaview Community Services. We strongly object to granting this conditional use proposed the conditional use permit proposed for this facility. This is an inappropriate use for this neighborhood. It would diminish the security and enjoyment of our property and properties of our residential neighborhood. There is far more appropriate locations for this facility in Seward that would not be that are would be more compatible. Please do not approve resolution 2021-008. This email is from Diana Morrison to sewer planning and zoning. Hello, I am writing in regards to a posting I saw on Facebook that Seaview has applied for a permit to open a treatment center on 2nd Avenue. I live in town a few blocks away and I'm very excited to see something like this available to help so many individuals in such need for many different health reasons. I moved to Seward in 2013 and received services from Seaview for counseling and guidance at that time. I am grateful for the help. I have a family member in California, a young man who has mental issues and wish he had some place to go for help. I believe it is necessary for our communities to start helping people in need. And to provide this space and to be able to accomplish this would be wonderful and, I'm all, excuse me, and I am all for it. I hope and pray they approve this site for it. I am excited to see Seaview grow and want to create the Health Center to help so many people with mental and physical disabilities. I believe it is a wonderful start for a more positive and healthy community. Thank you for your time and reading my outlook on the issues. This is from Art and Yolanda Lamaster. They live inside city limits at 401 Second Avenue. This is Yolanda and Art Lamaster. We live at 401 Second Avenue, corner of Second and Jefferson in Seward, which is directly across the street from the proposed drug treatment center. Residential lots in Seward are hard to find. We made a down payment on our site unseen about 18 years ago. We had a home built within seven, almost seven years ago. We're both retired and enjoying living in Seward within walking distance of the post office, senior center, church, and downtown area. I'm concerned about my wife being next to the proposed treatment center. Feedback from other people living near the existing treatment center on 6th Avenue is that they feel like prisoners in their own home. I don't want that for my wife. Resale value of our home would take a major hit, but that's a problem for my heirs and not as I do not plan on moving. We would think, you would think a drug treatment center for people with behavioral health conditions would not be located in a residential area, right? The sewer, the school bus stops in front of our house and there are kids playing down, up and down Jefferson all day long. A lot of people walk and run 2nd Second Avenue and Jefferson. Moving the problem from one residence to another, more bed space doesn't address the issue that the facility should not be in a residential area. Please deny the proposed permit. <coughs> Respectfully, Art and Yolanda Lamaster. This email is from Nanette Ambrosiani. Dear Commissioners, my name is Nanette Ambrosiani. I live in town at 419 2nd Avenue with my husband and three children across the street and over one house from the proposed inpatient drug rehab and medication dispensing facility. We have been raising our family here for 15 years, as did the family before us and other families for over 100 years. Thank you for this opportunity to submit my comments. I am opposed to the proposed use of this property as an inpatient substance use and medication dispensing facility. I am extremely disappointed to think that our quiet and safe neighborhood for over 100 years may no longer be safe and quiet. I believe the safety of the children in our neighborhood will be at risk because of the high rate of relapse rate, around 50% of substance abuse rehab patients and will have a negative impact on our quality of life. I believe that substance abuse recovery is a needed service for our community, but the proposed plan will eventually bring in people with substance use issues from all over our state. It sounds like a good business plan, but it does not need to be in a residential area to be successful. The American Addictions Recovery Center states, 
Of course, a treatment facility must research their potential building sites carefully. A facility should be located to cause as little disruption to the neighborhood as possible. Why is our quiet neighborhood with many families raising children here the best possible place in Seward for a treatment center? We have worked hard and invested a lot of time and money into our property and it's very frustrating to know that the proposed project will most likely have a negative impact on our property's financial value. Also is our understanding that if we were to sell our property, which we will consider if this proposal passes, then we would have to disclose this rehab center to potential buyers. If this is how Seward rewards good citizens, then why should we continue to live here? Other Alaska communities have chosen to locate these types of facilities away from neighborhoods. Why would a local nonprofit do this to our community? Sincerely, Nanath and Biarrazzani. This is from Marcia Umberger at 213 Bluefield Drive. Dear PNC members, I'm writing in support this letter in support of CD Community Service Plan for their new location of the residential treatment center on the corner of 2nd and Jefferson. This is about as perfect as a location as one could hope for. It is in a very near downtown area. Seaview's main building, where the majority of their programs take place, are well and close to the hospital if medical services are needed. All within walking distance for clients and support staff. Substance abuse is a disease and should be treated with the same respect as any other illness. Seaview has an excellent track record for this type of treatment program. The need in our community and state is great. They have been operating a substance abuse program at other locations for more than two years in residential area, area nor, nay, with neighborhoods, neighbors that are much closer in the proximity than they are in the location with no issues. Clients are supervised at the facility 24-7. What Seaview has done and is doing in our community is highly commendable. The potential individuals served in a substance abuse program are someone's son, daughter, father, mother, brother, etc. They are our loved ones. Seward has a huge drug problem for a very long time. People have complained for years that this community is requiring treatment. The treatment beds available in the state are very limited and long waiting lists. Before getting accepted into the residential program, the individual must go through detox program. They are coming into the program sober. They are supervised 24-7 by staff. No visitors are allowed. Traffic is minimal. The program is not a threat to our community, but rather an assist to all the families that live here. I personally do not live in the immediate neighborhood of the location being discussed. However, I would have the same strong support for this program if I did. Thank you, PNZ, for considering the rezoning and for the much needed treatment program for the community and the state, greater state of Alaska. Thank you, CBU, and all their employees who worked hard to make an impact on health and well-being of people's lives with the services they offer. Sincerely, Marsha. This is from Alan Nickel, Chief of Police. Dear Planning and Zoning, the Seward Police Department fully supports the efforts of Seaview Community Services to expand their recovery housing efforts. In 2018, the Police Department backed their efforts to open a recovery outpatient housing, and since then they have enjoyed considerable success in assisting people from within and from without without our community in returning to fully functional and productive lives. In a time where addictive drugs constitute their own pandemic, communities must be prepared to help. Seward is a peaceful place and a solid choice for those seeking recovery. With our natural beauty and quiet streets, we can provide a great place for recovery to happen. Some might think addicted people are the problem of law enforcement, but this is not the case. Those who deal drugs are the real issue for law enforcement. The people who are addicted to drugs suffer an illness and need help. Recovery in a safe environment for treatment is that help. As Chief of Police, I have heard concerns these people here to recover will be committing crimes in the community. But this is contrary to the truth. The police department has only had one case involving our current recovery housing we are aware of, and the person committed no crimes in our community. Meanwhile, we have addicts on our streets who routinely do commit crimes. It's very important we observe the distinction between the two groups. People seeking recovery are there because they realize it is their path to wellness and normal life away from crime and depravity. Addicts on the street are doing whatever they have to do to feed their illness. I would certainly rather have people in recovery on the road to health than living on the streets suffering and committing crimes. As a longtime partner to CB Community Services, we stand ready to support their efforts and to do what we can to help them succeed and keep people safe and healthy. We constantly try to find ways to collaborate for the betterment of the community and this effort is one of those ways. 
As we all know, they are primary mental health providers for our community. Access to mental health services and treatment for alcohol and drug addiction are high priorities for our community. This expanded recovery treatment project will be another step in that right direction. Again, we strongly support this effort and we hope you will as well. I thank the Commission for considering this worthy endeavor and encourage anyone to reach out to me with any questions or concerns. Thank you, Alan Nickel, Chief of Police. This is from Richard Cruz, Inside City Limits. Please read at the April 6th meeting. This letter is not meant to discourage Seaview's treatment center, but to encourage concern for its location. Please, a point to consider. Seaview staff and qualified the qualification to handle this number of clients. Seaview's history of documented success over the last two years. Documented failure rate of rehabilitation. Number of new addicts brought to Seward that stay. Number and drop in surrounding property values, increased residential traffic, clients want to remain anonymous, neighbors want to socialize and know each other. Suggest using Spring Creek, Mountain Haven, or other industrial sites. They, we ask for a six month delay in this decision to consider the repercussions. We ask that the several community meetings to be able to open this and openly discuss. Thank you, Dick Cruz. This is from Kevin Finch, to whom it may concern the drug treatment center that is being proposed at 2nd and Jefferson, I strongly object with. This is right next to the senior center, TYC, and in front of the school bus stop. Kids go on field trips from TYC all the time, let alone two blocks from an apartment complex that houses elder and disabled residents who walk down the streets daily. Allowing this will increase crime in the neighborhood and decrease property value along with rezoning the area. The fenced-in area in the alley is the perfect place for drugs to be tossed over like it has at so many treatment areas. Seaview claims in their 96-page report that they are helping the community, yet they're only focused on the drug community, not the locals living around it or their mental health. Why can't Seaview think about what they are doing to neighborhoods? They are making a lot of money promoting what they are doing with no concern of the neighborhood. This should be done at mile 7 where there is an open building that can handle this. Seaview is buying up houses which families could own. Yes, there is a drug problem in Seward, as is other cities, but the treatment center in remote area like next to Spring Creek where it is already rezoned. Seaview claims their clients would be detoxed before going to it and be locals first, which the way they view it is the inmates in the prison are in the city limits and get counted on the city residents, which means they come out of prison detox, most are not, into a local program. I have 25 years experience dealing with drug users in correction and a majority of them only want to take drug treatment to get their probation, yet their goal is to find the next high they can. They all have said it was a choice they made and still want to make that choice and only when they want to truly stop do they stop. Seaview has other treatment center in Seward that the neighborhood never knew anything about until it was done. Seaview should have walked the neighborhood and spoke with them before anything was done. The 6th Avenue one has numerous complaints to the police and people next to it feel they are prisoner in their own house. They don't want to let their kids or grandkids play outside because of what has gone on with just that one treatment center. The other one above the lagoon has had an issue even walkaways. I'm going to say the last name. Jason is an ex-inmate with extreme violent history, was one, was in one that walked away. Seaview is making a lot of money off drug treatment and should have to pay each resident the difference when property values drop. Each board member and city council member who supports and approves this be held accountable with a class action lawsuit each time any of the clients violate laws because of Seaview lack of compassion for the residents in the neighborhood. This location is not appropriate because of what is around it and in the neighborhood. Abtec dorms meet their same criteria, yet why not put it there? The CV staff and others support this should sell their house and move next door and see how they are willing to live with it. If not, they are hypocrites. Please do not allow this to take place in our neighborhood. Kevin Finch. This is from Kelly Baker, Wilson Street, and it is a letter to Chris Sheehan and asked to be read this evening. Dear Ms. Sheehan, on behalf of the Health Services Division at Chugachamu serving the Chugach region in Alaska, I wish to strongly endorse and support the Seaview Community Service application for the proposed expansion 
of recovery bedding, housing beds, and sewer. We support Seaview in their pursuit of expanding their recovery pro housing program and the request for a conditional use permit application from the city's planning and zoning department. The steps Seaview is taking to combat our community substance use disorder aligns with the results from the 2018 Providence Community Health Needs Assessment and the City of Seward's comprehensive plan. The benefit to our community because of Seaview's programs will only have will only have but a positive impact on our community and allow the organization to continue to focus its resources on assisting our community in having a continuum of needed treatment services to combat the current substance use disorder crisis. The Health Service Division works closely with Seaview Community Services and is pleased to help ensure community members receive the resources Guidance and guidance necessary to lead healthy and productive lives. Sincerely, Kelly Baker. I'm going to booger this up. I know. I'm sorry. I apologize. Hello. My name is Christy Skinner Audette. Baluk. Bagula. 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 I apologize. Uh, my house is located at 418 2nd Avenue, three houses north from the CUP application property of 402 2nd Avenue. I was born in Seward some 68 years ago, and our family has lived continuously at 418 2nd Avenue since I was four years old. In the 1950s, the 402 2nd Avenue property was a home for the Bloom family who ran a garage on the ground floor and lived upstairs. The auto commercial zoning is left over from the family's auto repair garage 65 years ago. It should not have remained auto commercial. Over these many years, this property has always been used as a home. Lately, the last family used the ground floor as three B&B studio units. I strongly object to the proposed CUP application at 402 Second Avenue to convert the use of the old Modern Motors building to a methadone residential clinic. This area is a residential neighborhood and not the right place to open a methadone clinic and housing for methadone patients. A methadone clinic should be located in a medical complex area, not a single family residential neighborhood. Second Avenue is filled with families, many with young children. It is not the right mix. Where are the families of the methadone patients going to be living? Open rentals are especially rare in the summer. Are the patients allowed to have free access to come and go? Many heroin addicts have resorted to theft in the past to maintain their addiction. Is that a pattern of behavior simply going to vanish? Heroin addiction is one of the most powerful addictions there is. Yes, I have compassion for someone suffering from heroin addiction and attempts at recovery, but the recidivism rates are abysmal. Who will have to deal with the fallout? The neighborhood families, the local police. Please do not issue a conditional use permit for a methadone residential clinic and housing in the residential neighborhood. Thank you for the opportunity to voice my concerns. This is from Katie Baldwin Johnson, the Senior Program Officer with Trust Alaska Mental Health Trust Authority. Dear Commissioners, the Alaska Mental Health Trust Authority, Trust, supports Seaview Community Services conditional use permit for 402 Second Avenue. That will be considered at your April 6, 2021 meeting and will expand their substance use treatment bed capacity. The Trust is a state corporation that administer, administers the Alaska Mental Health Trust and Perpetual Trust to improve the lives of beneficiaries. The Trust operates much like a private foundation using its resources to ensure that Alaskans has that Alaska has a comprehensive, integrated mental health program. Beneficiaries of the trust include Alaskans who experience mental illness, substance use disorders, traumatic brain injuries, intellect and development disabilities, and, or Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. Last year, our Board of Trustees approved a $150,000 grant in grant funding to CU for their recovery housing program recognizing that one of the most significant barriers to accessing need, needed treatment is the lack of bed availability. A common scenario faced by individuals with substance use disorder is that they identify a need for treatment only to be placed on a wait list which can take a minimum of three to six months to access care. During this time, individuals are unable to maintain absence and move towards, or move towards recovery often losing motivation to change, becoming involved with the legal system, and facing a greater chance of death. CDU's recovery housing program will address timely access barriers by dis 
decreasing wait times for critical recovery housing and treatment by expanding the number of beds for the recovery housing in Seward from 10 to 20. As a result of this project, mental health trust beneficiaries will be able to better access long-term recovery and improve quality of life. The trust appreciates the extensive stakeholder outreach that Seaview has engaged in for this project and the recovery housing program aligns with the priorities identified in the 2018 Seward Community Health Needs Assessment. The trust also supports Seaview's ongoing efforts to address the stigma that is experienced by beneficiaries who are seeking help for their addiction and their work to improve on how to our communities understand and respond to substance abuse treatment. Thank you for your consideration. This is from David Kingsland. Dear Planning and Zoning Commission, I am in favor of Planning and Zoning Commission granting Seaview a conditional use permit for the auto commercially zoned business property they wish to purchase. The business property that CB requests the CUP for has been located in the traditional Jefferson, Jefferson Street business zone for over 70 years. Many of the other businesses' partners along the same street have been in their present locations well before current neighbors were born, moved to Seward, or moved into the neighborhood. Starting on the east end of Jefferson Business District, you will find the American Legion. On the next block is the old Western Auto You Can Use It building and the Catholic Church. On the next block is Peking Restaurant and the Moriarty Dental Building. Right across the street is Tell Alaska and the former Floral Delivery Shop. The next block houses the former Post Office Museum and current Teen and Senior Center. You will find the Lutheran Church across the street. Crossing 3rd Avenue is the former home of Yukon Liquor and current home of two businesses, Yukon Lodging and SNS Laundry. Across Jefferson was a former visitor center located in a train car. The next block up is the business property Seaview is requesting a conditional use for. It is known as the Modern Motors Building and was a former auto garage back in the 1950s, a long-term rental to itinerant hospital staff, and currently a four-unit short-term rental which has a conditional use permit in place to operate as a nightly rental. Rounding off the block, one will find a medical complex consisting of an emergency room, clinic, helicopter landing pad, office trailer, and the former site of the Westland Care Center. Right behind the hospital is a 30-unit apartment building. As one can see, Jefferson Street has been and still is a vibrant and active business corridor. Seaview's requested conditional use permit does not change any zoning that is currently in place or tradition business use of this area and should be granted. Sincerely, David Kingsland. Madam Chair, that is the last of the emails that we received. Um, any emails that we received after the cutoff of Monday at 5 p.m. were forwarded to the Yes, thank you. Um, before I close the public hearing, I'll ask again if there's uh, any members of the public in the room or in the hallway that wish to speak on this item before it's the hearing session is closed. Madam Chair, there's no one in the hallway. Seeing and hearing no one, I'll close the public hearing at this time and bring it back to the Commission. The discussion, uh, there's a motion on the floor so we can begin discussion and prior to that I will uh, just close, I, um, uh, Ms. Ambrosiani had a letter and in, we have Mr. Ambrosiani on the commission and so to be um, transparent I would like to ask Mr. Ambrosiani if he feels he has any um, financial gain or loss that would cause you to recuse yourself from this um, item? I don't see any direct financial gain or loss. It, it, some of the articles I've read said that locals or homes around a substance use treatment would lose up to 17% of their value. Some said zero. Some other people have said that if this property is allowed to do residential treatment, then that opens the door for all the Second Avenue to become auto commercial, which would possibly increase values of houses on Second Avenue. So I don't see, I'm not counting or expecting an impact either way. So I, unless, you know, it's up to you guys what you think, if you think I need to recuse myself, um, that it could be, it could go any way as far as uh, value. Okay. Um, so typically then if there's a question or someone asked to be recused or isn't going to be recused, 
we would ask the commission if they are in favor or or not of the recusal. So I'll go ahead and just ask for a um, roll call vote of the commission on whether they believe Mr. Ambrosiani should be recused or not. Is that okay? Yes. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. Um, Swan? Um, yes or no means which way? Yes, recruit or no, recruit? Uh, no, he would not. He, no would mean he is not. Uh, you don't feel he should recuse himself. The need for recusal. And, no. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Verhe. Also no. Um, sorry, I don't have a. Um, cease. Cease. No. Uh, Charbonneau. No. Sullivan? No. I'm just missing me. Uh, me. Ambrosiani? Me. <laughs> okay. Eklund. I'll say no. Okay. All Thanks right. Thank you. I just wanted to have full disclosure on on that item before we move on. So, um, Commissioner Charbonneau, you were the motion maker? No? No. Commissioner Ambrosiani, you were the motion maker, so uh, you want to start the discussion? Sure. Um, point of clarification, if I want to have see a modification in the CUP, at what point would I bring that up? Would that be now? Um, it's open for discussion now if you okay. want to add a uh, condition to the, to the conditional use permit. Possibly, that's yeah. What, I'll, yeah. I'll get to that. I had a couple items. Okay. Um, I did go through and do a little research in, in the intent of our code uh, for Chapter 15. It refers to providing orderly development, promote safety, public order, and systematic development. So, to me, that means that we should determine the best place for this much-needed inpatient behavioral health services in our community. It has to happen with our community working together with us, this board, and Seaview. I really did like one of the comments was like to take a break for six months and sit down and try and figure this out as a community. I'm very much in favor of that. The proposed use does not match the zoning district. Auto commercial it's supposed to be a bridge between commercial and residential properties, meaning that commercial properties support residential properties and do not detract from nearby residential areas. Based on the comments tonight and the 59 names um, of people that in the area that live closest to this uh, change are against it, that to me tells me that there, it would detract from the residential properties. This one, Jackie, tell me if you want me to go differently on this one. But the property on 600, 2 or 3, 6th Avenue has come up a couple times. I did note that there was like seven people that signed this petition that were from right around that particular unit. And one of the comments that came up that was read said that they weren't given an opportunity for input before the change was made to that housing facility. And I started looking at that and I talked to Jackie about it because it was urban residential and I believe it started as a group home. And then it turned into a behavioral health inpatient treatment center, 10 bed unit. But I asked Jackie about the CUP for it and there isn't one that you could find. And that there was emails going back and forth with Seaview and the Office of Planning and Zoning, um, Community Development, and the CUP process never happened. And it was a change of use that would require a CUP. So there was no conditional use permit uh, for this property, and therefore, there's a code violation, so I really wonder if we should be able to even um, entertain a new CUP from an organization 
that has a code violation about a CUP they didn't get previously. And then the last thing, I think Ms. Uh, Mrs. Ms. Griswold came up and said it, was that the additional land use definition, there's, in under group home definitions, it mentions alcohol and drug use treatment centers. But we don't have that definition in our code. It mentions it, but we don't have it. We don't say what it is. We don't say where they should go. I mean, it should be updated to substance use treatment centers, most likely. But we should work together as a community to find out where do we want substance use treatment centers, do our job as planning, and figure out where that should go. As far as the current CUP, um, I would vote no on it right now because of these points. I think we might want to consider if it is going to get passed, I would like to see it changed to a one-year CUP so that the community could get back together with CV on an annual basis and review the status of the neighborhood. Okay. Next commissioner comments. Um, commissioner Swan or Commissioner Verhe, did you want to add to the discussion? I'll open it back up to the dais. Any other commissioner comments? Commissioner Sullivan. Yes, I do have a few. Um, just bear with me. If I'm not in my lane, tell me because I'm fairly new. So just tell me to get back in the lane. Um, my concern is, um, well, one, I thought it was a little bit unfortunate that the property was purchased before this process happened. Um, and that tells me that maybe they did their, re CV did their research and figured it out and that they it met the basic requirements for a facility for, of their need. Um, I concur with um, the thought process, and I highlighted too, it says it, it needs to be, uh, serves as offices in nearby residential areas which do not materially detract from nearby residential areas. And I think the presence of something like this might affect, negatively affect to some extent, at least on the initial aspect, uh, the residential areas in and around the, the uh, facility. I was also wondering too, is like, I think it was a million and change, I forget how much the, uh, the building was purchased for, but then the city loses the bed tax, the sales tax, and the other property taxes for that because it's a nonprofit, and like a lot of the other nonprofits in town, they don't pay that. So then that burden gets shifted to th those of us who are property owners in town, and so there's that consideration. Um, when Carol Griswold had brought up her questions, and I read her paper, and it was uh, on a lot of things that were concerning of the facility that don't make code or what she was addressing, that needs to be certainly reviewed to see if that needs to be relooked and updated in the CU CUP that we would have to re revisit. Um, just on the standpoint of the clients, uh, again, would they just be sewer clients and the rest? We don't know and we understand that there will not be any uh, people giving any information about that. But I, like several other people, were, has worked in law enforcement for, you know, 26, 27 years. And I worry about, you know, people coming into town and, you know, with certain criminal histories, that leaves the people vulnerable. Granted, you know, somebody who's trying to recover and the rest, but there's a lot of other things that, that go on that, you know, you, you have to worry about it and that directly related to the property values that you sort of mentioned. Property values, and I did a research on barons and a few of these other things, substance abuse centers don't make a significant change in property values throughout the country from what, I, what I've seen. However, say for example, you have somebody that comes down who's going into treatment, but is also a sex offender, maybe a treated sex offender or something along those lines. But if they are treated or not treated, we won't necessarily know but if there's a, and Alaska has a high sex offender population, but if they do come through and they are there, that potentially hits the property value itself, and that can drop to 20% if that is generally sort of known. So that's the concern on that. The thing about the MAT clinic itself, um, once you get to the MAT clinic where there's, you know, they're receiving medically assisted treatment, what would the traffic be like? I don't know. I don't know enough about that. How many people coming to get treatment and then going down to, um, the you know getting the medication and then going down to treatment is that going to increase works 
you know, traffic in the area itself. So there's a lot of questions that I have. So, but that's just my comments. And, you know, just as it is right now, I would also like to see it, you know, the CUP get reviewed, make sure the building is correct if that's what you want to do. But I think we should revisit again in six months. There's just too many questions that I have to be comfortable to say, yeah, I think it's a good idea right now. Commissioner Charbonneau? I, uh, like the other commissioners, have an issue with um, this uh, facility going in based on the zoning around, you know, uh, up against R1 and single family home on all four sides. It just doesn't seem like it fits here. It needs to be somewhere, but I don't know. It, it needs more room. Then people need more, more space to kind of do what they came to do instead of being hemmed in with a bunch of single family homes and people around. Mr. Cease? I, uh, in you folks sharing, you know, uh, one idea was, you know, with $1.3 million, one could, and I am a former architect, and looking at the floor plans, uh, there's even some rooms there that don't even have a door to go to a restroom, I mean, it really needs some redesigning. It. So maybe uh, we're talking about maybe six months or something, maybe we could look at some way of uh, coming up with a proposed plan and a proposed location other than where it is at right now. And uh, you know, the comments made are excellent on both sides of the fence. So, but. I really feel that the design of this thing isn't going to last all that long, the way it's set up. I mean, I'm, I'm an old man, and when I get out of bed and i got to go to the bathroom, it's a six-foot walk. And some of these bathrooms are through four or five doors, and you got to walk down the hallway and all that stuff. And if you're an addict, I guess maybe they might have other problems too. So I think we should look at maybe building a, a structure to meet the needs and future needs for the city of Seward. Well, um, I'm going to chime in because um, our packet tonight was prepared uh, very thoroughly by our community development department. And as the request for a conditional use permit pertains to our code, it is a legal request. Um, our code allows a housing, nursing, retirement, convalescent, um, in auto commercial and convalescent means um, a gradual recovery from an illness or to make progress towards recovery of health. Um, this property is zoned auto commercial um, there is a conditional use permit process for this kind of a request in auto commercial. So our city code says that that should be allowed based on the conditions that we put on that request. Um, the conditions that the fire department and the building department have put on it have met many of the concerns that I think um, Commissioner Sullivan brought up and some of the doors and the locks and I believe um, I don't believe uh, well I guess I could ask um, someone from Seaview to come up and answer some more questions on the comings and goings I mean I there's no visitors allowed I read that in the proposal um, it is sad that there is this one block of auto commercial there. Um, it's been in zone that since it was the Modern Motors, and it has never been changed. Yes, it is on the future land use map to be rezoned to a residential area, but it isn't. Right now, it's auto commercial, and a conditional use permit is allowed for this type of a facility. I do believe that um, we need these types of facilities in our community. I agree with the police chief and um, the uh, 
we had a principal and a pastor. Uh, I believe that we have probably more problems with untreated substance abusers and misusers than we do or would with people that are in these homes. I think we have many more substance abusers in our community than would be in a 20-bed facility. I believe that the priority is for community members first. I know that it's hard for people to get into these homes. I don't know, um, Ms. Gage quoted that there's beds available in other ones. I know that uh, in order to get into those homes, they have to be detoxed and they have to prove themselves. So sometimes that's why those beds are empty. Um, it takes a while for them um, and the people I've known that got, have gone into them to get their act together to be able to be allowed to stay in those places. Um, there is a letter in our packet from um, a realtor in town that says the properties didn't, values didn't go down near the current one on 6th Avenue, which there's probably no property in town that's gone down, so take that as you may. But um, I, I'm, uh, I'm kind of uh, like, we have a code. I like to follow our code. And I don't see where this comes in conflict with what our code allows, what our comprehensive plan um, states that we are, you know, to be helping um, this in our community. It's listed in our packet, the several areas that the comp plan addresses this. The strategic plan addresses it. So um, I'm, I am... Uh, and I'm, I'm following the code in, in my um, a, approval of this. I guess I would be approving it. I'm going to ask Commissioner Swan and Commissioner Verhey, now that they've heard the rest of the commission, if they wanted to um, add any comments. Commissioner Swan? Thank you, sir. Um, yes, I do have some comments. And I guess my view of this has to do kind of with, um, I don't think that this use or this property is um, significantly different than the issue that came up with the uh, rezoning of 2nd Avenue down by In favor of, of the CP. Commissioner Sullivan. Uh, thank you. Um, what I understand is that we're meeting the, the basic criteria, of, you know, for planning and zoning. It is office residential and the rest. But if we are going forward later on to have this become rezoned as R1, aren't we working against the um, where we ultimately are going to wind up going to? I mean, it, we're sort of undoing it. We're making it harder to do that if we're working in that direction. Um, it would all depend on who brings a rezoning forward and what that rezoning request is asking for. Across the alley, it's office residential. Mm -hmm. So as long as your, um, your property is across the alley, across the street, next door to it, you can ask for a zone change to that, mm -hmm. um, z that land use instead. Yeah. Yes, I thought those and, are the it, It's not really, I don't know, I don't, I couldn't pick out a time when the city brought forward a zoning change. It's typically a landowner that brings forth a zoning change. Mm -hmm. So um, a zoning change to, like they said, office residentials across the alley, um, urban residentials across second, mm -hmm. and R1 is across Jefferson. Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a hodgepodge. Yeah. So it's, yeah. Sure, can I just interact just to give you a little bit of background? Yeah, That's please. also following up with what Mr. Ambrosiani stated, that it doesn't stop the people around there for requesting to rezone their property to auto commercial also. So you do have a hodgepodge of, of zoning in the area, but um, Ms. Eklund is correct. We don't normally move forward as a city and rezone, we wait for the individuals in the neighborhood to start that. And then, and then in the process, if 
if somebody were to come in and ask for a rezone, we would then look at the area and say, okay, they want to rezone to this use. Do we want to try to incorporate the rest of the future land use in that block, which we have done. We've done the last two, you know, and people chose to stay out of it. So, you know, even though the future land use stated that they were CB, mm -hmm. those people decided to stay UR. And that that's totally by the direction of planning and zoning and council. Okay. Yes. And I don't know if you might try and touch on a little bit, but per the comp plan and the future, I think your map is a future map of what we've got together and it's looked at what we kind of want zoning to be. Most of this, these areas where the city would like to see them R1 from those uh, future comp plan. And by going ahead with this, we're kind of going against what we already said we wanted to happen. Our whole kind of like to get rid of these spot zone areas. I know you can't make them go away, but by allowing something that's just encouraging your spot zone is doing something we said we didn't want to do, going against ourselves. In, in, um, in some light, I, I can see that. In other areas, I can see where our comp plan has stressed um, expansion of diversity and economics and um, all these other things in our comp plan. We have uh, half a page of things that this request is supported by our comp plan. So I'm kind of weighing what our comp plan is saying in my decision um, that I see more benefit than harm. But isn't that in commercial or um industrial areas where we're trying to make those more um, business oriented and this area is supposed to be a single family and so it's on the comp plan it's not really supposed to be a commercial area it's supposed to be homes and we kind of all came together years ago and decided that that's what we wanted to see and we you know grouped together some of the uh, UR and OR and the office residential and um, in areas where we wanted to see commercial growth. And this wasn't one of them because it was almost all single family homes. And doing this goes strictly against what we said we wanted for this area. Well, I, I am still anxiously waiting our ground proving because I'm not certain it is mostly strictly single family homes anymore. And it used to be all urban residential. That's why you see so many pockets of blue in there. And then in the 80s, it went to R1. So I'm, I'm just, you know, I, I look at the growth of Seward and the needs of Seward. And um, I don't really think that we can dictate where somebody can and cannot open a treatment facility. If we have a zone where a treatment facility is approved mm -hmm. and a request comes forward, we can make conditions on that that uh, protect or um, that fall in line with some of our strategic plan and our comp plan and our code, but I don't think we can just, you know, I, I understand the concern um, from the people that spoke. It was pretty even um, pros and cons for it. From the petition, um, I, I'm not sure what was, how the petition was introduced. I see what's written mm -hmm. on it. Um, Matt, Matt no, Chair, thank you. If I can, Public hearings um, closed. Yes. If I can let you know, um, after talking with the clerk, that there we want to really watch the fact that we're calling it a petition. It's just basically a citizen input because okay. it's not a legal petition. Okay. Thank you. I have something. Yeah, Commissioner Rosiani. Yeah, I um, uh, it's kind of been skirted and come up with a couple times, and I I understand what you're saying, Madam Chair. But 
I do believe this is an unlisted use. And we don't have this use on our plans. And we're shoehorning it, shoehorning it into make it fit when it's not, we don't have this use in our plan. We have not updated our plan to have this use in it. I think we need to do that. And that is one of the goals of on our priority list. But I think right we need here, to do it before we approve or entertain the CUP. I, on our land use allow table mm -hmm. under housing, there is listed housing, nursing, retirement, convalescent. There's also hospitals too, and you could shoehorn this into a hospital. Well, under under the housing that I listed, a conditional use permit is allowed in auto commercial. Mm -hmm. So it is kind of But if you classified kind of it as a hospital, which I, it could also fit in that description because of the 24-7 care, then it's not allowed in auto commercial. It's only allowed in institutional and central business. Well, but where's our hospital current? <laughs> it's an institutional. And if you called it a clinic, it would be allowed outright. A clinic. Okay. So we we do have that. Yeah, yeah it, it it's not matching up, which mm -hmm. is is probably always an issue with the land use allowed because you can call a hospital, a clinic, a convalescent mm -hmm. home. I mean, those this are is, just this, your excuse changes. Me. Yes, but go ahead. This is, I, this is a huge need. Mm -hmm. I think we need to, as a community, address it as a huge need. I mean, it is a business venture because they're going to be using these facilities for taking care of folks outside of our community. So it's not just community service. I mean, it is, but it's also a business venture. But I think we should look at it like that and say, hey, these guys want to do something really good for our community, really good for our state. Let's figure out the best way to do it and let's zone appropriately. If you were going to, if you had a blank piece of paper and you were just, if you were planning a town, you would not plan a substance use center in the residential district. So why are we doing that? Why don't we plan and work as a community and figure out the best place for Sea View, for our community, for everybody, for this facility to be. And maybe it'll grow into something that hasn't even been imagined up yet. But I think we can really put some minds together. Instead of shoehorning this into a, a good, you know, a good buy, let's get together and, and make this thing work for the, be the best of the community. Well, I, go ahead, Ms., uh, Commissioner Swan. Hey, you know I understand what uh, uh, Commissioner Ambrosiani is saying, or, but you know that is that is not for planning and zoning. We're, he's talking about something that could be done at the city council level. It could be done at the community level. But but you know, and, and I'm agreeing with what you're saying. We have CEP in front of us that you know, uh, you know, the, the community, the business in the community has brought to us. And some of these things that are discussing um, are really not in our favor. We need to work on this, you know, if they're going to provide this service in this area, just like you were saying, is, you know, what condition do we need to place on it so that this can occur? Not if it can occur or not occur on this location. It's really about what conditions need to be met for that to be done. I just wanted to make that straight, and um, and I also bring up again, as I mentioned earlier, that um, you know it, it, the ground crew thing would be really good, but you know this area of town, how much of it truly is residential? Is it a higher percent residential than other areas that are, you know, office residential? We have uh, we have stuff mixed all over the place. That's all I know. Thank you. Um, so, is there any um, other discussion? Any conditions? You had some conditions that you were writing down. Yeah, if I you would. Brought this forward. Um, I would like us to consider having, and I'm not sure if I can do a condition on a condition, but I don't think that this 
conditional use permit should move forward until the um, the code violation on the 600 uh, 6th Avenue property is resolved. Because if, if that's needing, I mean, how are we supposed to enforce organizations that we go, what did we say you're going to do a CUP and then they don't do it? I mean, how, why, would, why would you be eligible to get a CUP if the last time you were supposed to get one, you didn't? So I'm going to... So I, I think that should be resolved before this gets completed. I'm going to take that question to administration and ask how you would address that. So, Madam Chair, um, first and foremost, you know, as you said earlier, um, this application, the Planning and Zoning Commission tonight needs to look at how our rules are right now and how it either approves or denies or doesn't meet the standards that are in our, in our code. Mm -hmm. Our code does have convalescent home. It is allowed by conditional use. That is what you have in front of you tonight. You can request to add co conditions to this. Um, as far as making decisions on what's happening inside the building, happening as far as building in general, that is not your area. It is the building department's area, and that's why we include those conditions in this application process. Um, as far as 6th Avenue, I did do some research. Uh, that home is, it is considered a duplex. They are operating it as a multifamily dwelling in an urban, urban residential area, and it is allowed without a conditional use permit. They are operating it as apartments, and it has been approved that way. So it didn't require a conditional use permit. No, and um, I, you know, I, I spoke to Chair or Commissioner Ambrosiani yesterday. Did tell him that I would look more into it. And you know, in the last 24 hours, I've had a lot on my plate. No <laughs> offense, but um, you know, just by sitting here looking at how that property is laid out and the um, comments that have been made about 6th Avenue, we will definitely look into that and make sure that that use is, is still operating the way that they had suggested. But that has no relevance to what is in front of you this evening. We will, the community development will look into it, but. Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. On that property too, it was there was a press release that did say it was be used it was used for behavioral health treatment. And and like I said, they they currently had petitioned or not petitioned, but ad addressed previous administration and stated that they were using it as a multifamily. And and we have to go off of what it said. You know, we didn't you know, so like I said, we will look into that property. We will work with the individuals that own the property and make sure everything is current. And, you know, if, if you know anything about me, you know that I will follow the code and that I also will, you know, bring forward conditional use permits. If it's needed and supposed to be there, I will enforce it. So at this time, is there um, any questions um, for the applicant? I would like to. Madam Swan? Yes, Commissioner Swan. Um, I have a question on this uh, fenced-in area on the uh, east side of the building. Um, do we know what kind of fence that is? Walk through the alley. Uh, I, I think it's, 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 it's solid wood, wood and I think it's six feet high at least. It's <coughs> fairly high mm -hmm. on the alley. Yeah. I, I think that's okay. the only. Uh, yeah, that was, that was like, because I was thinking about a condition. Um, you know, speaking of uh, some of the comments before about people being outside doing their workouts, you know, right in the streets around people. Um, 
I was thinking about making a condition that that fence be at least six foot high so that they have an outdoor area that's a little bit concealed from the uh, surrounding area, but it sounds like it's already there, so I think that's great. Um, I guess I could ask the applicant, um, uh, uh, Ms. Sheehan, did, would you be able to come to the podium and answer um, about at least the fence? There may be more questions for you. State your name and address for the record. Yeah, Christine Sheehan. I live out on Bear Lake Road in, um, outside the city limits, but um, CEO for CU Community Services. So, and if, if I'm, I'd like to ask if there's a question that's more clinically related, I have our Chief Clinical Officer, Tommy Glanton, here as well. Okay. So, w this question is regarding the fence on the east side of the property. Do you yes. know the height of the fence? I believe it is a six-foot fence. Six-foot fence? Yeah. And it runs the length of the property? Pretty much. It's down the kind of the back side, right. the lower end, and across, about halfway across and the property is, and back up. Is that also the side of the property that the connex is on that's going to be removed? Yes. Okay. And is it, I, I have a few questions, is it true that no visitors no. are allowed? Correct. Okay. And there was also a comment regarding traffic going to and from that primarily it, it probably because you have another one, primarily it's, well, you have a, a multifamily housing, not a treatment center. Um, but your plan is that you would mostly have staff vehicles and CDU community services vehicles there that the residents I mean is that typical residents at these centers don't have a vehicle I mean they're not that's, going anywhere right? that's correct it's not many would have a vehicle and um, so we provide transportation mostly back and forth to the center for the treatment so okay. it's a, it's basically where they live and um, are housed and then come and get their treatment at our center Okay. So the vehicles generally will have two to three staff members on site um, at any one time. Okay. Uh, one condition that's been mentioned in, um, uh, and I'm not sure if it was mentioned verbally by Ms. Griswold, was the snow removal location um, that typically you need to put all the snow from the eight parking spaces somewhere that does not um, impede traffic or site triangles do you have that spot decided yet well actually not currently because we're not actually that far along in the process but um, we do have a facilities property manager who takes care of that and when we have to have snow removal done he arranges that and as well as plowing and sanding and all of that so and, and that's not a problem at your downtown office buildings you plow there and remove yeah snow? we plow there and sometimes have to have snow removed okay um, No, I guess all my questions. Anyone else have questions for the applicant? Um, I have a uh, Madam Madam Commissioner Chair. Sullivan. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, the MAC clinic, and maybe this is just my misunderstanding, when you have uh, you have the residents there, but then you'll also have people coming to uh, getting medications, and then we'll go to clinic or go to treatment at probably the CV Plaza. Is that how, how that works? Oh. Kind of, ma'am. May I invite Tommy up? He's the clinical director, and he can explain that in great detail. Yeah, and it was just primarily because of the traffic, the vehicles coming and going in, in that area. That oh, if, if, it's an, if it's a traffic question, mm -hmm. um, we would probably have, it's not like a, a large number of people coming at the same time. to be staggered visits. Mm -hmm. There might be one or two people on site at the same time um, visiting the MAC clinic. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Verhey, Commissioner Swan, do you have any questions for the applicant? Uh, yes, I do. Go ahead, Commissioner Swan. Okay, I, I was reading the um, letter from uh, Tommy Blanton, and that's how you pronounce it. And are you expecting to have, um, I know that the layout is almost, almost 20 beds, are you expecting to have 20 um, Patients staying at this facility? Yes, that's the max. Or is it an expansion from, from 10 that you already have in other places in steward to a total of 20 in the steward area? So it's only 10. So the, it would be a total of 20 at the new location. So our whole program would be a total of 20. We wouldn't um, be having the recovery housing okay. at the old location. 
and that is okay. a um, that's really the current capacity of the um, of the home. What the difference is is that we changed queen beds, which could sleep two people, to two twin beds in a room location. So right now, um, the um, facility can sleep about 20 people, and possibly more if you have fold-out sofas. Okay. Any other follow-up questions for the applicant? Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, can I have a little clarification? Did um, It was asked to put another condition to review this in a year. Is, is that a go, or did you guys did I miss it? Did you have okay. that? Six months. Ago. I brought that up. Oh. So okay. would, would that mean that this, if this is approved, then is if it's approved, then we review it in a year? I would, I would like it to be a one-year CUP. A one-year CUP. And that we get quarterly reports on some of the issues that were brought up. That, you know, has there been any walkaways? Has there been any incidents with uh, local residents? Um, because I think we owe it, I mean, if this is going to go in, then we owe it to the community to make sure we're not disrupting the neighborhood. Okay. And that's that's what has to happen. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I I was surprised that the public comments that came in regarding the other home that that their report wasn't the same as the police report. So I'm hoping that anyone if this passes and anyone's in the area and there is an incident, you're reporting it. Um, maybe you aren't going to be here in a year when we review this CUP again, but the, it'd be on a police report, and we'd ask the police to um, bring forth a report regarding any incidences in the area, even if it's uh, someone scared your kid, uh, someone uh, drove fast. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not as concerned about the traffic because it's been run as a nightly lodging, which increased the traffic in that location anyway. So, but if there's dangerous traffic, of course, anything, if we don't get it reported, we won't get an ad adequate report back from the police department. Do um, I need to make a motion to that effect? Or yes, that would be. Um, to add an H under conditions. Yes. To okay. Review, uh, have the CUPC reviewed in one year and quarterly reports um, furnished from Seaview? From Seaview or from or the police from department? Like from, from Seaview. From Seaview. And, um, but I only wanted the CUP to, so it has to be renewed in a year, that we'd have community input uh, in a year just like we have now. Is that? something that happens, that we a, a, a CUP, uh, I mean, it, it doesn't it, happen in front of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Normally, you know, community development does the review of the CUPs that are active and current. If they aren't active or, they, or that we've received complaints, we normally send a letter, but we can bring it forward. I mean, you know, we have a lot of CUPs out there, mm -hmm. so, but it, if it's a condition, we can put it on the calendar to bring it forward in a year for review and approval well, at that time. My so, concern is if this is not working for the neighborhood, if people are feeling threatened or feeling like they're prisoners in their own home, the people in the neighborhood should have a recourse to make a change. And if the CUP allows this to go on indefinitely forever, then they'll never have a say. So I, I think it should be uh, a one-year CUP. And in one year, it gets applied for again. And if things are as good as everyone on one side of this argument says they will be, then it will get approved again. So um, if I was the person investing in it and it was on a one year lifespan, I probably wouldn't want to be an investor. But that's that's not our that's not our billywick. You 
you asked what it would take to have us approve the CUP, and that's what it would take to get my vote. Um, I I agree with a, an annual review, and and I don't even mind the, the quarterly reports, but. If someone is breaking the conditions of a CUP, can the CUP be pulled? Yes. Okay. So. So we would have to suffice? make it a condition that the community. It it specifically not? states modification, but it also states that the planning and zoning commission can modify it when changes of the condition cause the conditional use to no longer conform. To the standards that it was approved on, to implement a different development plan conforming to the standards as it was approved, and modification plan that should be subject to public hearing. So if they change the plan, they change the working and the dynamics from what is approved or not approved tonight. If it is approved this evening, then you as a commission have the ability, and so does, plan, uh, so does community development, to um, put out for a public hearing to revoke it. We, you, we've done that. I mean, you as a commission, most of you have already done that denial and pull of a CUP. So what, if you look, the con, this conditional use permit involves the conditions listed in the resolution on page 10 and the... 10 and the top of 11. Are those the conditions on this conditional use permit? Yes, ma'am. And that's all of them? Yes, ma'am. I don't see where in that it talks about um, what you, I think, Commissioner Brown was the on it. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what you are thinking would be reasons to pull it. So how could you word that to make that a condition? A uh, uh, multiple reports of it's got to be measurable. Yeah, we we you mm -hmm. have to have something. It's got to be smart. It's similar to what we already have. I mean, we have fifty nine people that signed up and said they don't want it. Um. So, but but we need we need measurable. Uh, Infraction. I understand, and I, I. If we do that, is that going well? We could do that. We could say that if there's an unusual amount of emergency calls regarding this property, then the CUP could be pulled. Okay. And unusual would be maybe, you know five times average for that part of town. Five times the average for that part of uh, town? Make it two times the average. <laughs> okay, so who who says what the average is? The police department? Police and fire. Because if it's I would say police and fire. Police and fire. And and what's the part of town we're talking about? Three hundred the everybody that got a letter? Three hundred sure. Yeah, or, or make it, you make it easier that maybe those two blocks. Well, we, we, but yeah, everyone I mean, that got a letter. everybody that got a letter. Yeah. So if there's five times the infractions well, are let's say two. Calls, five two, seems kind of high. If there's two, two times, times. Well, this is we're, we're getting a new condition <laughs> down. Okay, if there's twice as many emergency calls within the notification area of this CUP within one year of the CUP initial granting, that would be a, do you know? <laughs> no? How do you, are you directly correlating this to that business? To that because property, to that property. To just to that property. Just to that property. Okay, because I thought I heard you say in that well, area. Well, t yeah. twice as many as that area. So if that area okay. currently in okay. one year has 10 emergency calls and we, in this specific location, gets twice that okay. in one year, then the CUP would be pulled. So we're adding an H that says um, within the 12 months of the current CUP, 
emergency calls are greater than two times the average 300 foot radius calls, the CUP can be revoked. If the emergency calls regarding this property. Regarding this property. Well. And that's annually, not just the first year. Yeah. So what's can? Can. Versus will. How do you differentiate can? It has to be will. It has to be will. It has to be will. Will. <laughs> will revoke? Mm -hmm. Will means it will. May means. Mm -hmm. Wiggle room. So. Right now, this CUP had wiggle room, but we're going to disband it with no wiggle room? No wiggle room. That, it, that's not I, real good governance. <laughs> it, I, I know that everybody doesn't like the word may, but it is something that, in a code language, may gives you the ability to review it, to decide whether you're going to revoke it, to follow through with your conditions, but if you say will revoke, then it doesn't give that public input at all. It gives just what has happened from reports that were given to you. And you would then, you know, you, you wouldn't revoke it, the community development department would. So when you put May in there, then we have the ability to bring it forward to you as a commission to review the standards and conditions that you've placed on that property. Yes, uh, Chief uh, Kreitz. So I'm agnostic to pro or con. I just want to give you guys an emergency responder. Yes. This is a very quiet neighborhood. So if I respond to one fire alarm and one, that could be at your house, right? I mean, you don't know. You slipped three times on the ice in this winter, and I come to your house three times. That's three times the average. Again, I'm just shoehorning right. it. this that way. It's just that's my opinion. I'm it's it's uh, it's it's a tough measurement. True, but we're already going against what most people in the area feel they don't want just by looking at this. And in order to go against what most people in the area don't want, it needs to be fairly substantial. Right, but I you also you have to weigh off of what your current code says. You can add conditions, conditions all day long, but at the end of the day, right now, you have to look at how that property is zoned and does it meet the criteria within our code as it stands today. You may want to change code, code is changeable, but we have to review it as it is now. And you know, public input, all of that aside, you as a commission have to look at where our current code stands. I would say adding conditions that, um, you know, we could add this H, we can word it that, um, you know, Clinton is correct and, you know, you don't know if somebody's going to fall outside that facility and is that going to be caused as one of the emergency calls but if you worded it that um, if it was harmful to public safety health or welfare those are the type of calls that you would be measuring off of instead of emergency calls of somebody falling or having a heart attack those are different than you know deeming whether or not something happened that was illegal? public safety illegal health. correct that's that I mean I just I want to make sure that we have the the right criteria and the right tools for you as a commission in 12 months if this is approved this evening to decide to extend their CUP and or give them you know, doable conditions that they can meet as property owners. So could the word be illegal reports? No. No. I mean, we just heard what Mr. Johnson said. The facility is allowed in that, on that property. And the applicant has come forward mm -hmm. with a 
conditional use permit, and and we have to use the code. I mean, just and uh, and we can add conditions. We can add conditions. Been trying to, but but just an emergency call, as the fire chief has said, could be somebody just slipped and fell on the ice at your house mm -hmm. three times, and it didn't happen at all last year. So now the CUP is. Because they had one call. Mm -hmm. Like if you didn't have any calls in that in that neighborhood and then you had one call or they had one call and it wasn't anything, you know, it was something that was medically needed, a heart attack or something, then you would revoke their permission to Based do so. Based on the concerns you but have, I, what would you recommend? I, to be honest, I really feel that... Um, the commission is trying to shoehorn how a business should operate. And the commission needs to look at how that building is zoned right now and does it meet the conditions of the zoning. And if you don't like those conditions, add one, but it needs to be enforceable. I, you know, I can put emergency, two times the emergency annual calls, but you know, there could be a loophole in there, too. And I, uh, from a legal standpoint, I don't know how that would, you know, how that would be justified. We would have to discuss it with the city attorney. But this business does not match the zoning district, which it, says the property does not, you know, does not negatively impact the residential area. It, and we heard from the residents. And that is what you as a commission have to look at. Even with public input, even at the end of the day, the people that you know don't want it in their backyard or don't want it here, we do review that. But you have to look at how your code stands today, and today it is an allowable use. Madam Chair, go ahead, Commissioner Swan. So I guess to put this in a different um, aspect. If the property owner right now wanted to put a gas station in, I think in all commercial that would be uh, allowed outright. Yes. And you'd have traffic, you'd have things going on, you'd have a whole bunch of stuff. You know, again, just what um, Jackie was saying is that you, you can't stop that. Even though all the neighbors would be totally up and on because it's private property and the code says there's certain things that can be done with you know, private property. And it's not our position to determine what somebody can and can't do with private property. Except for just we said. I mean, this is this is a conditional use permit we put conditions on. So we could say, hey, traffic patterns have to be a certain way or or something like that. But, you know, there's all kinds of situations that are going to come up with private property where the neighbors don't like what's going on, but that doesn't mean there's a legal right to say yay or nay. And, you know, I, I feel like we're getting into an area that, again, is, is uh, you know, you're opening up the, the laws, the city to a lawsuit. Because you say, hey, we're not going to, you know, have this arbitrary condition or, you know, say you can't do this here. We don't, because the neighbors around here don't want us to be here, you know, that doesn't mean we have the right to be able to not let something happen. That's so, all I have. So do we, do we, is your amendment to add an H still an amendment because we don't have a second and we would have to vote on that amendment? Yeah, my amendment would be that it renews annually with, um, Okay. Quarterly reports. That one. Okay. And um, I want I want the ability that if the neighborhood is being negatively impacted, that it can be revoked. The you know a business like this has to be held accountable by the by that neighborhood, and I want that built in somehow. And if they can't be accountable to the neighborhood, they shouldn't be able to continue Madam with this. Madam Chair, yeah. I think we can add the, the review and the quarterly reports. Mm -hmm. But I think that you're really at a, a 
disadvantage for the applicant as well as putting us into, uh, you know, like Mr. Swan said, um, when we start saying, you know, the neighborhood is going to decide whether or not they make it or break it type thing, we shouldn't be in those. We, you as a commission and the city should not be in an area where we decide yes or no, your business plan was good. That is not your place, it's not my place, and it's not the council's place. So I think that, you know, adding that type of condition, I would really, I really strongly suggest that we put the review of it, bring it back forward. It can be a public hearing. You can have it reviewed as a public hearing item, giving the ability for the neighbors to come in do just exactly what they've done tonight, and you as a commission can weigh those at that time. But I don't think that you should put a condition that says, if the neighborhood just doesn't like it, we're going to get rid of it. it. It's not, I don't think it's right. I don't think that's legal. So then what you said prior to that? Which? So, that it's reviewed in a public hearing. Also, a conditional use permit has public hearings. So. Correct. But this one would have to be remu reviewed at PNC in a public hearing right. annually. Right. Yep. That's, yep. Okay. That okay. condition can be in it. Okay. So, so, is there a second to that amendment? I'll second it. Second by Sullivan. Okay. Uh, let's vote on the amendment. Can I just make sure I understand? It's um, <clears throat> that the CUP be reviewed each year in a public hearing and that the commission receive quarterly reports from CVU related to the facility. Is that yes. accurate? And it would be an H in the conditions. But the reports would need to tell us about walkaways and any other... How would we work? How do you want to work that? Well, even just asking for reports, then you know, administratively, we can we can give a list of you know, give us the walkaways. How well, many we patients. we can ask we, the police the department that. for a yep. police report. Okay, we, we'll, we'll include that. As yeah, I'm sure the incidents that are related to criminal code activities within the uh, facility and, and within the reporting area and and. Just as we got a report from the police department today mm -hmm. for this one, we would get a report from the police department mm -hmm. on the next review. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be criminal code associated. Yeah, yeah. right. Okay. okay, so we have, we got it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so. voting on that amendment. Cease? Yes. Verhe? Yes. Yeah. Swan? Yes. Ambrosiani? Yes. Charbonneau? Yes. Sullivan? Yes. Chair Eklund? Yes. That amendment is approved. Okay. Any further discussion on the main motion on resolution? I lost the number. 2021-008. 20, 2021 Any further discussion on the phone? Any further discussion? On the commission at the desk, no. Could we have a roll call vote, please? Voting on the approval of resolution 2021-008. Swan? Yes. Sullivan? Yes. Verhe? Yes. Charbonneau? No. Ambrosiani? No. Uh, cease? Yes. And Chair Eklund? Yes. That resolution is approved. I'd like to ask for a five minute recess and then we will come back and move on to public hearing number two. 8B2. Recess in 927. This next one is a, yeah. We're,
Okay, we're ready. I call back to order from recess the um, April 6, 2021 Planning and Zoning Commission. And we're moving on to public hearings on B2 Resolution 2021-009 of the Seward Planning and Zoning Commission, granting a variance from Seward City Code 1520 signs to Providence Seward Medical Center, permitting an exception to the zoning code to allow for two additional signs to be permitted on the premises located at 417 First Avenue within the Institutional Zoning District. We need a motion and a second. I'll make a motion to second. approve resolution 2021-009. I'll second. Motion by Charbonneau, second by Sullivan. <laughs> Staff report, please. Madam Chair, Providence Seward Medical Center has applied for a variance from the Seward Planning and Zoning Commission to implement a rebranding branding campaign and upgrade all signage on the premise. The applicant is requesting to install two additional signs for a total of four signs which require permits. The Planning and Zoning Resolution 29, or sorry, 1998-09 was approved by Planning and Zoning um, sign variants for one additional sign due to the building having two street frontages and two primary occupants, PSMC and CH, or SCHC. The Commission is authorized to grant special variances from the provisions of the chapters in accordance with the following restrictions. And those restrictions are listed. If you'd like me to read them, I will. If you um, public comment and we have property owners within 300 feet, of the parcel or notified to of this proposed conditional use. Sorry, that says conditional use and it should say sign variance. Mm -hmm. Public notice were posted on the property and all public hearing requirements of the Seward City Code public hearing were complied with. Any comments received after the publication will, would have been presented. We did not receive any and um, we received one and it was included in the packet. The, our recommendation is based on the findings provided in resolution 2021-009. Staff recommends granting a variance from Seward City Code Providence Medical Center, permitting an exception to the zoning code to allow for a total signage area greater than 200 square feet to allow two additional signs for a total area greater than 200 square feet at Seward, Mount, or Seward Town Site Marathon Edition 3 Platt 1A 417 First Avenue in the Institutional Zoning District. And do you want me to read the restrictions or are you good with them being in the packet? Um, I'm, I've read them and... Um, if, if anyone on the commission wants them read into the record, I would go ahead and ask Ms. Wild to do that. Nope, I've read them. Okay. So at this time, I will open public hearing on resolution 2021-009, and we have one uh, member of the public who wishes to be called. Correct. We will call Carol Griswold. Past her bedtime. You're with Planning and Zoning Commission, and you have five minutes for a public hearing on Resolution 2021-009 for the sign variance. Thank you very much. Carol Griswold within 300 feet. I'm opposed to another variance for more new signs for the Providence Building. The current internally illuminated signs are very bright at night. The only sign that needs to be that bright is the east-facing emergency sign. More and larger signs would unnecessarily create light pollution, create clutter, and add confusion. There are no valid reasons for exemptions from the code, no special circumstances such as health or safety, topography, etc., that necessitate more signs. They just want to change the name and separate their signs from their co-located neighbor. Providence can easily update the existing co-located signs with their new name without a variance. To ensure community health care center moves into their own facility, Providence can update its current signage and placement without adding any more. If the main entrance monument sign is updated, the physical address should remain at the top of both sides. The new design shown on page 69 places it so low it may be covered by snow. By denying this variance, the Commission will carry out the spirit and purpose of the sign code by modifying
reasons to oppose the second variance are in my comments on page 74. Note the typo on page 55 and 57. This is an institutional zone, not an industrial zone. Note the location aerial on page 82 is out of place and in the middle of the street naming resolution. Thank you for your consideration. I hope you support the code. Bye. Thank you. Is there anyone in the audience wishing to speak on this item? Seeing and hearing no one, I'll close public hearing on this item and bring it back to the commission for a discussion. Commissioner Charbonneau? Um, yeah, I don't really see an issue with this. I drove by today and it's not particularly well signed. Um, I will agree that it would be nice to have the, um, the address on the top, but I don't think we can really tell them what they need to put the address on the sign. So that's just Commissioner Sullivan, did you have any comments as the second? No, I have no. None. And anyone on the phone wishing to comment on this resolution? I would. I do think it's kind of concerning to take away the emergency sign, like shows exactly what it is and seems to be kind of one of the more important parts. So. Yeah. Oh, cool. Um. Commission, Commissioner Ambrosiani, I'm going to ask you, is, is, are you, were you involved in any of this re, um, No, I wasn't, signing? but I think it would probably be a good idea for me not to vote on it. Oh, I wasn't going to ask oh. you to recuse. I just oh, wanted okay. to know, <laughs> what, did, I mean, as, aren't you pretty involved in the Seward Community I'm the, Health I'm Center? I'm the director of the yeah, Health Yeah, that's center, what yeah. I thought. So, I, did you give input on this sign? No. Oh. Huh. Okay. Um, does he need to recuse himself? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, but I do want to answer. They're not taking away the emergency sign. Um, I, and the emergency sign is not considered in that 200 foot square foot um, by previous admission. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at page uh, 67 and 94, and on existing, mm -hmm. the, the address is at the top, and then on the conceptual rendering, it's at the bottom, but it's black, on, it's white on black, I, I don't know, I guess the, the snow doesn't get removed there, but um, I'll leave that up to uh, Commissioner Ambrosiani to... Make sure it's placed in the right spot up there. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, do we still continue? Now that we have two people on the phone, we do roll call vote for each mm -hmm. item? Okay. So is there any further discussion on this item? No. Um, I just, I have one statement. Allowing this with the use of a variance is part of the, our code. A variance is in our code. So we, we're still following our code. Roll call vote, vote, please. Voting on the approval of resolution 2021-009. Verhey. I vote no. Charbonneau. Yes. Cease. Yes. Swan. No. Ambrosiani. Yes. Sullivan. Yes. And Chair Eklund. Yes. That. Resolution is approved. Thank you. Um, we're moving on on the agenda at 9. We have no unfinished business still. 10 new business resolution 2020-010 of the Planning and Zoning Commission of the City of Seward, Alaska, recommending City Council approve the renaming of Dairy Hill Lane to Chamberlain Road, located north and west of the Seward Lagoon in the Cliff Addition to Seward Township. A uh, motion by the commission, please. I'll make a motion to approve resolution 2021-1010. I'll second. Motion by Charbonneau, second by Sullivan. Um, staff report, please. 
Madam Chair and Commission, on February 9th, Mr. Lear petitioned the Community Development Department as well as um, sending the same request to Council um, to requesting that Dairy Hill Lane be renamed to Chamberlain Road. Mr. Lear provided backup documents explaining the need for the rename and the street merge. Dairy Hill Lane, which runs from Seward Highway to the first curve near the top of the hill, was dedicated by Platt in 20, or 2021. But, sorry, dedicated by Platt 20, 2000-21. Prior to that Platt, it was an unofficial place name in use since the 1950s. In 1960, Platt number 28 identified a 60-foot right-of-way strip of land Dairy Hill Road. Within the U.S. Survey 241, Dairy Hill Lane was officially named by resolution on number 93032. Dairy Hill Lane turns into Chamberlain Road where the U.S. Survey 241 meets Cliff Edition. Further south, Chamberlain Road turns into 2nd Avenue where Cliff Edition and Lumbar Edition meet. Chamberlain Road was dedicated by the Cliff Edition in 1916. Its original name was Government Road, and in 1990, the City Council changed the name from Chamberlain Road to honor, in honor of E.E. E. Chamberlain, a longtime resident, former City Council member, mayor, territorial senator, and accomplished gardener who lived on Government Road. City Council Resolution 8510 established a street naming and numbering system provided standard approach to naming and numbering the streets within the city limits. The recommendation to rename Dairy Hill Lane to Chamberlain meets all sections of the Resolution 8510. Street naming and system. In order to add a road name to the Kenai Peninsula Borough E911 Master Street Addressing Guide the road must officially be named by council resolution or accepted through platting action. The recommendation is to approve planning and zoning resolution 2021-10, recommending city council officially rename Dairy Hill Lane to Chamberlain Road. All right, Commissioner Charbonneau, the motion maker. Yeah, um, I was wondering you know, it's kind of confusing having three names, and now we're considering having two names, which is still a confusing. Is there any reason we're not just making it Second Street all the way down? I mean, it would make it simplify everything and it wouldn't be confusing. I'll direct your question to administration. So on the, the map in general, if, if you were to decide to, oh, I'm so tight up mm. in the That's okay, you don't have to point to the map. Can... It, yeah, I do. Okay. So, you have 2nd Avenue that turns into Chamberlain. Yeah. And if in a perfect world this were to be extended, you would still meet, you would still meet the criteria of making it 2nd Avenue, except for it loops and hooks to the highway, and your street num numbered streets normally run straight. straight. Yes. But there's no stop sign in that area. It's just like it arbitrarily changes names. Yeah, the, the, there's absolutely no stop signs. Yeah. It, it doesn't, you wouldn't know. There's and, no and this was Government Hill, I mean, and that's why they changed it from, from Van Buren, Van Buren on. on to this corner right here. So Van Buren to here is Chamberlain, and then from here to here is Dairy Hill Lane. Okay. Okay. Um, I, we get a lot of name changing on the Borough uh, Planning Commission, and it always has to do with the directions and the crossing the streets and it, you know, a uh, lane has to go one way and a road has to go the other, and it, it gets convoluted. But solving three names down to two names will help in the emergency response, which is better than nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, we still have Dairy Hill. There will always be Dairy Hill. It's that hill. It's Dairy Hill. Um, people will still have magnets with Dairy Hill or 
maybe so lucky to have a milk bottle. But um, I think uh, Chamberlain, you know, he, he was a gardener. Most of the double Sitka roses you see in town came from his yard. Uh, he lived um, right where the Hope Cottage is up there, or maybe that is the Seaview Cottage now. I'm not sure, but that was where his house was. So I, I, I think rather than change it all to Dairy Hill Lane, I'm in agreement with changing it all to Chamberlain. Anyone else? Comment? I have a personal thing on this. Yes. I've worked with Steve Lear for 41 years. New York Life Insurance Agency. Okay, but you have to keep it on the topic. Okay. Yeah, well, he's wanting to change it to yeah. Chamberlain, so I agree with him. All right. Any other comments from the commission? Anyone um, on the phone? Commissioner Swan or Virhe? No. <laughs> okay. It does make, I think it would make more sense to make it all 2nd Avenue, if it is the continuous road. Well, I guess I don't really understand just that it changes and intersects with the highway, that it cannot be. It's the way it Which? runs. Yeah. yeah, it's That's the directional um, road naming rules put out by the emergency responder organization. Oh, got it. Okay. Okay. All right. Any further discussion on the commission before we put it to a vote? Seeing and hearing none, I'll ask for a roll call vote. Voting on the approval of resolution 2021-010. Swan? Yes. Cease? Yes. Charbonneau? Yes. Verhey? <laughs> yes. Sullivan? Yes. Ambrosiani? Yes. And Chair Eklund? Yes. That resolution is approved. Thank you. That takes us to 10 2, Resolution 2021-007 of the Planning and Zoning Commission of the City of Seward, Alaska, recommending City Council approve the walkable mural application guidelines and administrative policy. Motion for... I'll make a motion to approve <coughs> resolution 2021-007. I'll second. Motion by Commissioner Charbonneau, second by Sullivan. Staff report, please. Madam Chair, um, as many of you that are on the commission will remember, um, in 2019, council um, requested that planning and zoning um, do a couple work sessions as well as design an application process. And so we've had the work sessions. On September 15th, 2020, we had another work session. We reviewed the application that is incorporated with tonight's resolution through community development as well as public works. And we would work with the applicant on the design and maintenance. Um, there is a current application fee of $500 that would be non-refundable and then a deposit of $1,500 for the three years and in that three years the proposed crosswalk and walkable mural would have to be maintained by the applicant and um, resurfaced if at any time that it fails to be maintained and the plant or public works has to go in and repaint then the $1,500 would be revoked and used for those costs. Okay. Commissioner Charbonneau? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I was wondering, in putting this application together, did we ever, did we look at incidences with distracted drivers? I mean, one in five incidences happens with people that aren't in cars, biking, walking. I feel like having somebody looking at fancy artwork, which would be awesome, but is something that we would probably want a little focus on driving and not looking at the road. So Amen. we did not we did not do that type of you know, I, I worked with other cities, looked how other cities incorporated these type of artistic crosswalks into their neighborhoods and into their cities in general. A lot of the cities are larger cities and um, some of them were quite small, but uh, the larger cities, in all of my research, I did not see where they monitored or saw any added accidents regarding a artistic crosswalk. To be honest, 
most of the things that I read and surveyed would have been just the latter. It was people slowing down, being more observant in the neighborhoods that these are, are at. Commissioner Sullivan? No, I like it's a good idea. Okay. I have a few questions because uh, there, there's a couple of different, like, pages. So page are page 88 and 89 the application? 88 and 89 are the application, and then the project, the guidelines are on page 90. That would be incorporated with the application okay. just for information. So we've got two different speed limits. On page 88, it says 25 miles per hour, and on page 90, it says 30. It should say 25. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> and and um, I think that under maintenance and permit holder agreement um, on 4, it should say without prior approval from the community development director and the public works director. Otherwise, it looks like you're one and the same. Okay. And then... Um, did uh, well, did legal review this, or does legal not usually review they our don't applications? They do review okay. administrative, um, but just so the approval or denial, with number three, it goes has to go through public works and community development once right. that's like a staff review, uh -huh. and then our department would issue the permit or deny the permit based off of the direction from what's happened in number step three. Okay. Um, so another thing on 90, which is different than on 89, we have an indemnity agreement on 89, and on uh, 90 it says we need a certification of liability insurance. That's the same thing. Okay, but so I, yeah, it, I would make them to say the yep, same thing? I will do that. And then um, 15 days of submittal installation may occur within the approved date, time, and location. So uh, the right-of-way permit will be reviewed within 15 days of submittal. Is that is that just your review time? You're going to review it, but you need local business or other community-based or sewer community-based. Maybe we want sewer in there. What if Moose Pass wants to do one? Okay, um, or sewer community-based. Yeah, okay. All right, I, and I, I drove... Just coming here today, I counted 12 possible spots. So most of them are like right in here. And, you know, I could see, you know, one had waves and um, we, there's one right next to a church. Maybe they want to put something in. There, and, there, you know, I, I've had a lot of people call me regarding these crosswalks. You know, the, the, the design implementation is amazing and thinking that somebody could put you know a totem pole you know mm -hmm. that's one of the natives mm -hmm. corporations have asked about maintaining and having a totem pole there's been talk about where mount marathon race starts yeah. putting the city flag mm -hmm. as that type of introduction um there's i've seen some that were the transverse, not the transverse, but the latter, and they were in front of libraries, and the black mm -hmm. spots looked like books, mm -hmm. which, you know, I, I, there's such an, a wide variety, and I do, you know, I've had a lot of people comment on disapproving them because they think they'll be messy, but um, the, the people that have approved them have sort of outweighed that you know their their concerns have been met, and the holding them accountable, making them you know pay the five hundred dollars that's non refundable, the fifteen hundred dollars that ensures that they are going to maintain it, and if they don't, then our city will put it back to the crosswalk. Well, if if as as I was looking at our crosswalks, they need annual maintenance, so. Uh, whoever is doing this has got to be prepared to do annual maintenance because uh, I don't know how many other of the entities you talk to, cities you talk to, have the weather we have, but it, it's gonna it's gonna be some work. So so, and I can also let you know that Stanford University did a study specifically on paint for roads, and it was done in Alaska. And it was interesting. I mean, huh? I tell you, I've been in every portion of this part of 
implementation and the standards and the paint that is required. You know, it's not just go get a gallon of paint. It's making okay. sure that it's kind of durable. Yep, yeah. so Commissioner Ambrosiani. So if we have, um, say, two businesses that want to paint one crosswalk, how would that be resolved? And then is there any, do the businesses have any input over what would be out in front of their property on the crosswalk? So, um, Chair, Bro or sorry, Commissioner Ambrosiani, the, the answer to that is administratively we would do first come first serve. And then as far as businesses deciding what happens in the right of way, you know, they don't get to dictate now if there's a crosswalk and it would just be painting that crosswalk. So they, you know, I would assume that they would, you know, the business or whoever is wanting to do it would talk to the businesses. But <coughs> as far as this application process, we would not petition or go, I mean, it's administrative petition or administrative application just allowing it to happen. Yeah, I'm trying to think of, I'm sorry, I, I'm just concerned if there would be a way to detract, that a mural would detract from somebody's business and they wouldn't have a say in it. But I'm, I'm trying to think if that could happen, but I'm not really sure how it could happen. Hopefully. Madam Chair? Go ahead, Commissioner Swan. Well, uh, this falls into the same situation as all the murals around town. Uh, the murals on the ground aren't going to be different than the murals on the wall. We haven't run into any situations over the years. I don't expect us to run into something with these murals. Okay. Commissioner Sullivan, you had a comment? Yeah. Yes, Madam Chair. I, one question I had was, you know, the approval or denial, what are the criteria for that? I mean, that just sort of, because everybody is saying how much we're doing and how we can do it, but is there something that could, you know, potentially, you know, you know, knock something out? I mean, obviously, if it's some horrible looking thing that somebody has, but is there some guidelines or some sort of... Well, so yeah, the design those, guidelines, that's what we would that's go by. It. I mean, us, community development, public mm -hmm. works, would would look at all the, the criteria. These guidelines right. are what we're going to work within. So we're going to look at the artwork. We're going to make sure that they they are within the lines, that they don't contain any white, yellow, or red in any way that could confuse traffic control. Mm -hmm. No logos, no text, no advertising, no octagons or triangles or shapes. So, you know, we're really... <laughs> Shapes that can be confused yes. with traffic. Right. But the the whole premise is, you know, working with the applicant to make sure that design. And, you know, I incorporated some that had been done in other cities just to show what they could look like. And, you know, that's where we'll base it. We'll make sure that within that design criteria, you know, that it's not a business logo. It's not... You know, it's not referencing any of those type of things. Okay, I, I have one question. If someone applies, gives you $500, and you deny it because they don't meet one of those criteria, are you giving them their $500 back? No, non-refundable. So they better have read <laughs> the packet yeah. Correct. before they give you $500. Correct. Hmm. Okay. Wow. All right, well, um... Any more comments regarding? Roll call vote, please, on resolution 2021-007. Voting on the approval of that resolution. Verhey? Yes. Swan? Yes. Ambrosiani? Yes. Cease? No. Sullivan? Yes. Charbonneau? Aye. Uh, yes. <laughs> Chair Eklund. Yes. That resolution is approved. That takes us to item 10, set a work session topic for May 18th, 2021. I'm going to start on this one because that is graduation night, and Commissioner Ambrosiani and I have graduating seniors. I was wondering if we could move that to May 20th. I don't see anything on the May 20th calendar. 
would that be acceptable to others before we start working on a topic? It's going to take all that long. So I would like to add, could, could we... Could we add to the 20th the review of the land use allowed table? We've had, we've had a lot of dealing with the land use allowed table in the last year. We all should be fairly familiar, except maybe Commissioner Sullivan, but she has two weeks to do that. I mean, could we start that discussion? Uh, depending on what you expect from administration, if you're just wanting to start from the very top and work through it, <coughs> Well, I'll if, just if, provide that, but if you're looking at doing an exact change, then I need to be able to have the time to do the research to do that change for you. Well, the reason we're reviewing it would be to make some changes, to recommend some changes. And, and we can absolutely do that. I just wouldn't be able to give you anything except for that land use table. Right, no, that's so, what we'd okay, start with. Yeah, yeah. The land use allowed table. Yep. And we'll just start at the top and move through. And and the only other thing I might ask of you is if you've had public input on the land use allowed table where someone has looked at it and said, ah, why can't we do that there? I, if you mm -hmm. have an email or something that, well, that you could just bring notes saying. I do have I do have that for one, but there's a lot of history with that and a lot of research that has already been gone into, but we can discuss it at the work yeah. session and then bring forward whatever types of so, changes you'd like. Is, is the commission acceptable to adding to the April 20th? Yeah. We're going to review and, and a draft one, ordinance. Too, because mm -hmm. I, I just, what happened tonight to me was just horrible. And that we, I just feel terrible that that, that happened. And it's not what the neighbors in the community wanted, but we it still went through because it because the zoning information was not clear enough or updated enough, I think, to put this type of facility in in a location that didn't impact neighborhoods. Welcome to the world of material site extractions, gravel pits, and the burrow. <laughs> we get the most public at our, those meetings. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm sorry to say that we have to go by the code, and, and we've, we've, yeah, that's off topic, but that, I'm sorry. Right. I'd really like yeah. to see if we can start figuring out how to keep what happened tonight from happening. So right. I'll, if it's okay with everybody, I will put that our April 20th will be discussion of ordinance changes or re definition changes to housing, lodging, and dwellings, mm -hmm. as well as review um, of the land, current land use table. Land use allowed table, yes. Okay. All right. Um, so, and then we change um, the May... But now you want to talk about what topic we have in May. Oh, but before we get there, we, we have not brought back our priorities. We have not finalized our list of annual priorities and discussed it at a meeting and brought it back to council for approval. Yes, so, it will be on your May 4th. May 4th. Agenda. Okay, and I have the notes from the clerk, which you probably got, and I made some notes, but okay. All right. Because that falls into where we should be putting things on our work session. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So we still need a topic for <clears throat> May 20th. So we may not be done with the land use allowed table. Um, we may, maybe if we are, we can move on to municipal lands inventory and management plan. The priority listed... That as a short and midterm, and I and I think that the, the council agreed with the that. The land use plan. Yeah. The yeah. Municipal that, lands that's inventory. one that they, you know, I started carrying around this. Yep. <laughs> yep. I have it. Yeah. So, um, and I know that it's weird that we're in our April meetings, but deciding the May, and it's just because I'm extremely short-staffed. Courtney's new. And I'm just trying to make sure that we, we use the time that is off of your priorities and really give us the ability to give you all the information that you need so that you can make determinations and work in that work session. So that's why we're asking for the May 
Um, now. now, one other thing that we had several items discussed is why aren't we having more meetings because there's so much work to be done? And also, why are we having four meetings with the historic preservation? And that was, I believe, a big misunderstanding about where the Historic Preservation Commission lies in the organization of the city. At one time, it was under planning and zoning. We did those functions, but it changed, and it has its own admin staff now. Yes, they do. It is not <laughs> under our purview, and our admin staff, of course, cordial, helpful, Madam communicate, Chair, but I don't think we need four work sessions with that. And you guys them. voted to have it turn to two a year. Right, but we still have four on this the, calendar. I just did not update that calendar. Okay. <laughs> well, just it's also update. on the back page that we have one in May, and I, and, I don't... And, yeah, you're going to have them twice a year. Okay. I will update this calendar and put it in the action agenda also, just that it's been updated. Okay. But, um... The other thing as far as why do we not have more meetings? Number one, <laughs> meetings, if something is time sensitive that we don't, you know, we can't meet the deadline and it has to wait, you know, it's something that has to be done within that month. We've always brought forward the ability to have a special meeting on the nights that we have our work sessions. We've done that multiple times. But as far as well, then we turn around and we give it to the staff. They have 10 days to respond back for staff comments. Sometimes that even takes longer because they have to do their own type of research. So then 10 days prior to, we have to send out public notices. We try to send those public notices out prior to more than 10 days. I try to do two weeks. Sometimes I get them out a little earlier. Posting has to be published two weeks prior in two different calendars, as well as the public notice has to be put on the building. That all falls in line with a month turnaround. Okay. Government doesn't move as fast as everybody would like it to move. No, no, but I, I won't trying. say how I say it, <laughs> but on May 4th, it looks like there was a planned work session prior to our meeting. Yeah. Can and we keep will... that work session and continue working on the land use allowed table or the municipal lands inventory management plan? For the hour before? For an hour before. Maybe on the 20th or on the uh, 20th we, we get a good start on the land use plan or the land, al um, land use allowed table and we can continue really push it out another hour right before that meeting and not have another meeting, but just a little earlier. You're killing my birthday, but yeah, sure. What? <laughs> we'll have cake. <laughs> we'll have cake. Okay. Is but that, yeah, that's... Is that I mean, okay? I mean, because I I, yeah. I really took it to heart that we we have a lot on our plate and and we need to move forward on it. Okay? And it'll help you learn yeah. more. <laughs> She's so excited. <laughs> Any, uh, Commissioner Swan, you had a comment? Yeah, if, if I recall, when we, when we talked about historic preservation, you know, part of having the, the four meetings was, um, and, I, and if I recall the way that you talked about it, was that it's scheduled we could have them. But a lot of that was if they wanted something, uh, if they need, felt like they needed to discuss something with us, then we'd have the meeting. Otherwise, the meeting could just be canceled. And I know the self-preservation is really wrapped up in the CLT grant right now. I'm not sure if they're prepared to have a meeting with us in May. Right. Uh, Jack so, was shaking her head no. So, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that whole part about having four, we might have switched it to two. But just because there's two scheduled doesn't mean we're going to have two. just means right. that we have time set up if we need it, if they need it. Okay. So are you requesting to have a, a work session prior to our May 4th meeting from 6 to 7 regarding land use? Land use allowed table. Land use allowed table. continued review of the land use allowed table. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, that gives you almost a month to, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. And, and I know it's building permit time and all that stuff. Okay, what? Um, <laughs> let's see. Where are we at on this agenda? Uh, informational items and reports. Um, Madam Chair. Yes. May 20th, did you decide the topic? I'm, I'm not clear on that. Yeah. Land use. So land use. Land, the municipal land the municipal use plan. Municipal land use plan. Thank you. May 20th? On May 20th. Instead of the 18th. Yes. It's a Thursday. Graduation. Yeah. The, Craig and I both have seniors. Oh, you do? Yeah. And it's huh. the graduation's the 18th. I had seniors 30 years ago. <laughs> well, you can come to this graduation. I'll invite you. <laughs> Okay, A was the uh, planning and meeting schedule, which I think we passed over pretty well. Um, city calendar kind of made some changes on. And so any other reports that we needed to review? No. No? Okay. Commission comments. Let's start with our newest commissioner. Welcome again, Claire. It's nice to be in the same room with you. Thank um, you. It's good to be here. Do you have any comments for the night? Um, it was uh, a... Um, quite the firestorm here it was for my first meeting official real official meeting uh it was uh, quite a quite the engagement um but you know i've learned a lot and everything else like this i think we're moving in the right direction uh, i will probably learn a lot as the things continue so i appreciate it. thanks for everybody and their patience thank you commissioner Verhey. um thank you for allowing me to call in for this meeting and uh jackie all your hard work appreciate it and yeah, was well, quite quite the long long storm, but we got through it. So, thank you for taking the yeah. time to call in while on vacation. Mm -hmm. um, Commissioner Ambrosiani. No comment. Commissioner Charbonneau. Uh, yeah, I would like to thank and welcome the new planner, and then, like always, the staff as well. Thank you very much for doing all this hard work for us. Commissioner Cease. Yeah, I, I kind of uh, agree with um, Courtney, architect, me architect, and I think we're going to get along really good. <laughs> <laughs> Architects think differently than all the other people. So. Well, don't tell us that. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Swan, do you have any commission comments? Yeah, you know, my my comment, it kind of has to do with you know, this whole situation that you know, Craig's brought about. You know, a lot of times we're put, we're put in a position where we have to uh, basically overcome public interest because of legal responsibilities. And, you know, and that's really what the situation was with, with the... Um, Know, our, our first uh, resolution there, um, you know, and, and you know, we know, you know, that, you know a lot of times stuff's going to come up that that isn't what we feel is you know best for the area, but you know there, there's you know a legality or it is, and that's what our responsibility is um, to deal with, and it, and it isn't easy, you know, and that one of course uh, wasn't easy. But um, I think we did the right thing. Thank you, Commissioner Slom. Um, yeah, it's um, it's hard when you love your community and you get the most community outpouring for tough subjects that, by our code, we're not allowed to to say, "Yay, yeah, we're so happy you're here and want to talk to us." So let me get your name right, Courtney Brainhurst. 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 Brain. Bring. Brain. Bring. Brainhurst. Okay, yes. I was going to call you Brain, but that's okay. Brainhurst. B r a i n. B r i n g. Brain. Brainhurst. Brainhurst. Well, thank you for coming to Seward, um, and I hope we get to know you and that you uh, really Hang in there. love this job and stick around. <laughs> And um, thank you again, Brenda, for mm -hmm. keeping us in line here and oh, yeah. uh, taking the Comments. minutes. 
And Jackie? We need citizen comments. We'll yes, we need, questions. before I close this, you mean? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, we have another call. Okay. Um, we will move on now to citizens' comments, limited to five minutes per individual, and they have one opportunity to speak. And we have someone who wishes to be called. And we will call Carol Griswold. Oh, my God. I'm just going to check and see if she might have texted me that she doesn't okay. want to be called. In the meantime, do we have another member of the public who wishes to speak? Okay. I'm a little calmed down now, not <laughs> such a big crowd. Um, I do live in city limits, just to clarify that. I don't think I said that when I was up here earlier. First State of all, name. Cameron Kowalski. I live in city limits. Um, first, I'd like to thank you all for being here tonight. I didn't realize how complex and hair-pulling these situations must be for you guys. Um, secondly... It was a little disheartening to hear Commissioner Ambrosiana refer to Zach's little outburst as him being very upset, and we should take that into consideration. Um, should I have stood up when I wasn't supposed to be speaking and pointed my fingers at people's face and yelled, would that have got your attention more? Because I was sitting right next to him, and I don't know if you could see through, but it was me he was pointing at and oh, screaming at. And you were like, he was very upset. We should take that into consideration. And as a community member and a taxpayer here, that's a little disheartening. We all had our chance to get up here and talk. He had his five minutes, and that's how it works. So I hope in the future you don't take those little fits and disrespectful bouts into consideration. Um, I, that was my other thing. My other thing is you keep saying, like, we were doing it right for the neighbors. I think you guys did really good at doing your job tonight and following the code. And there was neighbors on both sides of the fence. Not everybody was naysayers to that situation. I feel like just as many people spoke out in favor of it. So... Um, I hope the next year goes great with that place. I hope we don't have a lot of emergency calls. Um, and I think I'll stop there. I have a lot more written down, but thank you guys. And thank you. Yeah. Um, did she? Okay, I'll try. No, she didn't text okay. me. Oh, sorry, Cameron, you're good. I'm just going to try one. I think I'm dialing the right. Okay. Is there any other citizens wishing to make a comment? Council Member Bethlon. Tony Bafflet, Inside City Limits, 1904 Phoenix. Um, my comments are of my own and not of the City Council. Um, I just want to welcome uh, Commissioner Sullivan. It's public knowledge now, but I voted for you. Um, I voted for you because I thought it was really important for you to step up and when you came and um, offered your help on um, the CARES Act um, distribution, I really appreciated that. So it's glad to see you here, and um, and uh, hopefully we can meet someday. <laughs> I don't Many think days. I've met you yet. <laughs> but congratulations and welcome you. um, your sacrifice for the board, as well as other board sacrifice to be here as well, is really appreciated. Um, welcome to Courtney. Um, I hope you... Well, welcome home. <laughs> Why don't you stay a while? <laughs> um, and um, th I would like to thank administration for all the hard work that they've been doing as well. It's been a long process of waiting um, for the walkable murals, but I'm glad that we can move forward with the application process. Um, and thank you so much for all your service. We really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you for your Okay. Um, one more time. One last time okay. on citizens' comments. Okay, she that's must, it. Maybe she's on the phone. Um, is there any commission or administration response to the citizen comments? I do. Commissioner Ambrosiani. Um, uh, to Ms. Kowalski, I, I do apologize. I didn't mean to be take that to be taken the wrong way. I just noticed that, you know, he's a parent and he's quite upset. And, uh, but he should not, he should have stuck to the rules, and you're right, he had his five minutes. Um, and then it was also, yes, there were two sides of the story, but I was keeping track, and I didn't see any of the local, anybody that lived near the facility. I didn't see anyone that lived near the facility um, in favor of it. Jim Gutkin? Well, Jim's okay. just up the street and he's on the board, yeah. But, yeah. but I didn't. Uh -huh. That's why I said it that way because yeah. I didn't see any of those people. You didn't. 
I'm sorry, didn't, you didn't see them what? I didn't see, I didn't see the people that live around the um, property um, comment in favor of it. Okay. So there's a way we do this, and so you've had your... Oh, I'm but, sorry. Yeah, yeah. no. You're, you're fine if you want to continue. You're, no, you're no, fine. I'm good. I'm just saying no, Cameron. But, um, <laughs> uh, we can talk after we adjourn. If you want to talk some more, that is off record, but yeah. Just not in a group of four or more. Not in a group of four or more. Um, I'll take a motion for adjournment. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. So moved. <laughs> adjourn at 10.30. See? 10.30.